All right, guys. Well, welcome. Hopefully, you can see my screen now as we uh, uh, start our Power BI takeover. Again, if you're if you're really interested in seeing my my smiling face, I'm also on Periscope right now. If you're if you're into social media stuff, you can view me on that as well, uh, where I can see your questions kind of pop up there uh, on the side of my my phone. Uh, so. I'm I'm really excited you guys are here to join me today. I think this is a, a an interesting take that we're doing here on our webinar series. We know you, you know, many of you guys know we already do weekly webinars uh, every Tuesday for free that are one hour sessions. But what we're doing special today is a completely devoted three hour training session. So it's 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 much more than a webinar. I think we're going to spend three hours looking at Power BI. I realize that many of you that are logging in right now can't sit here for three hours, so don't worry. Yes, this is going to be recorded, and it will be available in the next two, one to two days. I'd say probably two days is safe. And uh, so what we'll be doing is we'll be going through an end-to-end -end picture of what Power BI looks like. Uh, my name is Devin Knight. If you're not really familiar with me, here I'll give you a little bit of my contact information on the next slide here. You can uh, find me on Twitter. If you're a Twitter person, it's Knight underscore Devin. You can also email me later if you have questions at dnight at pragmaticworks.com. A little bit about myself. My name is, again, is Devin Knight. I'm the training director or training lead here at Pragmatic Works, assuming this all goes well, of course. And I'm a SQL Server MVP, really a, a data platform MVP now is how they term it. And basically that just means I, I, I do a lot of influencing with the Microsoft community. Uh, and really my focus is around uh, Power BI and, and business intelligence in general. I have written some books, so in the past I've written up to six SQL Server books. Most of them have to do with SQL Server. And I also run a local user group here in Jacksonville called the Jacksonville SQL Server User Group. We're actually running a pretty large event here this Saturday. If you're in the Northeast Florida or Southern Georgia area, we're having SQL Saturday Jacksonville. It's a free event this Saturday at the University of North Florida where you can attend and there's going to be seven different tracks of technical sessions all for free. So if you're in that area, you can certainly join us. Uh, I also blog at a website called devonnightsql.com where I've written quite a bit about Power BI and other topics. Uh, but if you take a look at that uh, website, you'll find a lot of the sessions and a lot of the topics that we're going to be talking about there I've also written about. And uh, so I'd encourage you to take a look at my blog as well. All right, so a couple things here logistics-wise in case you're just logging in and want to know what in the world it is we're doing today. Uh, we are doing a three-hour webinar. I'm really going to call it a three-hour training session here uh, from 11 o'clock Eastern Time to 2 o'clock Eastern Time, still 2 p.m. And we will take a couple breaks because I realize no one wants to sit, no one really physically can sit for three hours straight without taking a couple breaks. So we'll take a break about once every hour and uh, we'll make sure that you're able to, to get some time to move around and not only for you but for myself as well. Hey, Devin. Uh, we're also going to, yeah. You've got like a weird um, mechanical sound coming through your microphone, so I don't know if you can fix that. Really? Is it pretty consistent? Yeah, it's like every 30 seconds or so. Okay, let me see if I can swap out my mics here. Yeah, that one was really bad. <laughs> Can you hear me now, Liz? Yeah, I can hear you. Is it still uh, kind of a mechanical sound, or is it, uh, how's the sound now? It's good. Okay. All right, thanks. Great, so hopefully that's coming coming through clearly, no problem. Uh, and uh, so what we'll do is we're going to be going through this end-to-end -end tour of Power BI. Uh, we will take a couple breaks, and the session will be recorded. So, of course, you can always watch it later if you needed to. If you need to catch up later, uh, you'll be able to do that. All right. Now, here's our agenda. Here's what our plan is for today. We're going to be going through, uh, like I said, really an end-to-end -end look. So we're going to start all the way with an introduction of what Power BI is. So if you're brand new to Power BI, we'll make sure that you uh, get at least an idea of what it is at a high level before we start diving in deep to how, to how to use it. We'll also be talking about several phases of Power BI, starting with the data discovery phase. So starting with how do I actually get my data out of the different sources that I have. So you might have multiple types of sources that you pull data from. And so we'll be talking about each of those inside of this session, this three-hour session, as we go deep and deeper into um, each of the topics. We'll also start talking about how do I then transform the data. So once I've got the data out of my different data sources, how do I apply business rules to the data through the transforming data section here that we'll talk about. 
and then we'll get into data modeling. So once I've got the data in from the different data sources that I have, how do I actually organize it to eventually build some reports off of it? And that's what we'll, we'll, call, what we'll talk about during the data modeling section. So we'll talk not only about an introduction to what data modeling is, we'll also get into the details of how you can actually create your own data model. Uh, we'll then talk about creating calculated values and calculated columns and calculated measures. Those, those values that you can create, those calculated fields, are much easier to, to make it much easier to be able to build reports because it's going to allow you to have additional fields that you don't necessarily have in your data source. And so we'll spend some time talking about and talking through how to do that. Finally, once we get those calculated fields created, we'll, we'll talk through building out some visualizations. So we'll talk through a quick introduction to visualizations before we go through the process of actually building out several types of reports. So we'll go through how to use many of the different types of visualizations that are inside of Power BI. Once we've done that, we've got final reports built out. We'll also then go through and build and excuse me, and publish the Power BI service. The Power BI service is uh, a cloud service. Oh, so someone said the audio is actually worse now, Liz. Does the audio sound okay to you? Um, it sounds okay to me. Unfortunately, guys, when you have this many people on, uh, people are going to encounter issues. It could be various of things. So, you know, again, it sounds good to me. So we're just going to go with it. Okay. No problem. And everybody now is saying, uh, sounds good, sounds good, so... <laughs> okay, all right, no problem. All right, so then what we're going to do, once we publish the service, of course what we want to know how to do is, how do I get the data refreshed? How do I get the data updated so that as each day go by, goes by, each couple hours go by, that I make sure that I have the most up-to-date version of the data showing to myself or to my users? And so we'll talk about how, what were the steps to actually scheduling a data refresh towards the last hour of our day. We'll also then look and at least talk about mobile devices. Obviously, it's going to be difficult to do that through a webcast, but we will talk and uh, show you at least some screenshots of what mobile Power BI looks like so you have an idea of how you can also do mobile BI. All right, so let's start with a, a bit of an introduction here to at least get everyone accommodated to what Power BI is because, I, again, I don't want to assume everyone in here has actually used Power BI before. We did a poll question a few moments ago and it looked like the majority of folks are actually completely brand new to Power BI. So what I'd like to do is talk briefly here, at least to begin with, about you know what is Power BI, what is, you know, I'm familiar with maybe what business intelligence is, but I don't know necessarily what this Power BI tool is, or maybe you're not even familiar with business intelligence. So that's what we're going to spend some time talking about here to initially kick off our session. All right. So if you're really just completely brand new to BI, if business intelligence is completely new to you, think about it like this. It's a way to take your data and form it in a way and organize it in a way to actually make decisions off of it. It's a way to get data that you have in multiple different silos. Maybe you have data that is in multiple different silos, siloed systems. So say, for example, you have Oracle where you have HR data in it and you have uh, maybe SQL Server storing sales data in it. Maybe you still have some mainframe stuff out there. I'm sure there's many of you guys on the phone that also have mainframe. And you want to be able to take that data and pull it all together. Well, that's really the case for doing business intelligence projects. Now, there's multiple ways you can do BI projects. You have corporate BI or enterprise BI, which is more the traditional way that you do BI projects. So this would be the IT-driven way of doing BI projects. If you've done BI in the past, years ago, or even maybe today, you're likely doing corporate BI solutions, which are all IT driven, meaning that you create some, uh, the business creates some requirements documents, they meet with IT, IT create, uh, reviews those uh, IT requirements, or those requirements, and builds out a solution, which might take months, it might take years in some cases, but it's a very corporate driven solution where everyone that you want to have access to can get access to it. It's usually the most scalable solution because it has a lot of servers in the back end that are running the solution. And it's also ones that can deal with more complex problems. And when I say more complex problems, I mean things like data quality problems. So if you're pulling in data that, let's say for example, let's say for example you're pulling in data that is customer entered data. And you have customers that enter in their state information on their own. So sometimes they type that information in, so sometimes they type, let's say, Florida, and they might spell Florida all the way out, F-L-O-R-I-D-A. And sometimes they do an initial for Florida, they'll just put F-L. And sometimes they'll do FLA. And so you get a variation of different types of ways that people enter in data. And it's a data quality problem, right? Really, all of those different instances of Florida you should equal the same thing. 
and yet they're entered in differently and they're stored differently in your database. And so what we do with corporate BI solutions is you have things like data quality services, master data services that Microsoft provides that allows you to take that data and be able to consolidate it and have kind of that golden record of what that state information really needs to look like, or here's what my customer really needs to look like. That's corporate BI. Corporate BI is, is great. It's all, I'm, I'm a corporate BI guy in my past. It's, uh, it's not going away anytime soon, so don't, don't think that. It's always going to be around. So there's a different case on why you might choose corporate BI versus the other types. On the left-hand side, I have personal BI. Now, personal BI is, is also known as self-service BI. This is where the, the people that have the problems they're trying to solve, the power users that really need to know the answers, are also solving the problems as well. So you can think of this person as your Excel guru that you have in your office. This is your power user that knows Excel really well. They know how to use pivot tables really well. They know how to do things like Excel formulas and functions really well. They, they know more about Excel formulas than IT staff members do. And so these are the people that now take data and spreadsheets and data dumps, and they're building out solutions on their own, and primarily through Excel. And so what they're given now through the technology we're focused on today, the Power BI technology, is they're given a way to be able to build out their own solutions pulling in those multiple data sources they have and being able to create some really in-depth visualizations and dashboards uh, that we're going to talk about. And it's done through a way that's very familiar to them. It feels very much like Excel. In fact, a lot of the languages that we're going to look at are very similar to Excel formulas as we start diving into the middle part of our day. And then finally, the middle option that I have here, the Team BI approach, this is really a matter of taking something that was developed by a personal user, by one individual, and making it so that it's shareable to others. So taking something that I developed on my laptop or desktop and sharing it through some kind of a shared service. And, and through the scope of what we're talking about today, that's the Power BI service. It's taking something I developed on my desktop and publishing it to a shared service called PowerBI.com. And so we're going to talk about all the, really the first two steps here. We're not too much focused on corporate BI. That's, we have many webinars you can find on our website about corporate BI. But we are focused on both personal and team BI today. Team BI is going to be like the last 30 minutes of our day. But the other two and a half hours will be focused on actually doing it on my desktop, creating a desktop solution that we eventually deploy to a shared service. All right. So one of the things to also be aware of as we're talking about this is the different roles that come to play when, it, when we're talking about Power BI. As we're developing these solutions, there's a lot of different roles that you could play. Now, you could have one person that plays all four of these roles. You might have one person for each. You might have two people that cover all four of these roles. But these are the different types of roles that you have within creating a, a self-service solution. The first one I have here is a data wrangler. A uh, data wrangler is really what I consider them is someone that is the subject matter expert on the data. They know the data extremely well. They know where to go find the data. And they also know how to organize and create relationships between different data sources that you have. So say, for example, that the scenario I gave you before where you have Oracle data is storing HR information and SQL Server storing sales information. And you have mainframe data as well. You have all these different data sources. And it, right now, it's really difficult to get all three of those to talk to each other. The data wrangler knows how they can talk to each other and what fields relate to each other so that they can all be brought into a single solution. And that's what we'll be doing with Power BI is taking multiple data sources and merging them into one uh, easy to consume uh, solution. That's the data wrangler. So they're the subject matter expert. Now the data steward is really kind of the person that's in charge of making sure that things don't get out of hand. So one of the things that IT is very wary of, and for good reason, one of the things that IT is very wary of when it comes to Power BI is if I give Power BI to my business, let's say I give Power BI to my finance department, then if I give them uh, this solution, then I'm going to have my entire finance department, which might be made up of 10 different people, all creating their own solutions using the same data structures. And if they're all creating their own solutions using the same data structures, oftentimes what we'll find is they might come to different answers. I have 10 different people, they're all looking at the same data source, and they start coming up with 10 different answers on, on the same question. And so what the data steward really is in charge of, and this is something that's becoming more and more popular in different organizations, is they're in charge of making sure that that doesn't happen. They're kind of a, 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 a very small, I wouldn't call them a roadblock, but they're a very small uh, step in the process to make sure that we're not having multiple solutions shared with the whole organization that all are based on the same data but are different, uh, giving different answers about what profit is, for example. 
Maybe I have uh, 10 different people and they all have their own different twist on what profit means. The data steward's in charge of making sure that there's some cohesion across those different solutions that are deployed. All right, then the next one I have here is a power analyst. This is someone that would be basically like your report developer. They would take the data that the data wrangler provided, build different visualizations on top of it so that they can eventually publish them off to the Power BI service. So they're going to be your report developer here taking what the data wrangler created. And then finally, the collaborative user, this is going to be the person who will uh, be more the data consumer. They're going to take the data that you've now visualized and make decisions off of it. They're not necessarily going to be the person that's building reports. This is the person that uh, up until maybe two, two years ago, maybe two weeks ago, depending on your organization, they were the people that liked to have the data printed and put on a report and printed and put on their desk each morning. Uh, they don't necessarily do that anymore, but this is the person that they're not very tech savvy necessarily, but they're very business savvy. They know what, what's going on with the business and they're using the reports that you provide to make decisions. Okay, and they're part of this process as well. All right, so again, all of these roles, you could have multiple people play each of these roles. You could have one person that plays all the roles, but uh, these are some of the things that you'll see when you're creating Power BI solutions. All right, so a couple of the terms that get out of the way. You've heard me already mention this term, self-service BI or self-service business intelligence. This is anything really that, uh, uh, Liz, you still have audio. I see a couple of people said audio issues. Is it? Yeah, no, it's fine. Again, everybody, if okay, you're having... Okay, yeah. yeah, if you're having issues, just double check all of your settings, and I will say if you're on Wi-Fi, if you can, try and hook up to, to a wire because it tends to do better. Okay, I'll just let you interrupt me if, if there's an issue. Sounds good. All right, so terms, terms to know here, really just some of the steps to get out of the way. Self-service BI is really any solution, any uh, data analytics type solution and, and an approach to doing analytics with your data that doesn't require IT. Okay, so you don't have to have IT there for every step of the way of building the solution. Now, they might be there for some instances. Maybe you need them to get access to certain data sources and things like that, but you don't need them there every step of the way to be able to create a solution. That's, that's the whole idea behind self-service BI. All right, so that's the first one here. The other one here is Power BI Desktop. This is going to be the main tool that we use for developing our Power BI solutions. It's a standalone tool that allows you to do things like data extraction, data modeling, and data visualizations all within inside of a single tool. Now, it's, it is a completely free tool that you can go and download from PowerBI.com. So if you go to PowerBI.com, you can download it, and uh, you'll be able to, if you're watching this as a recording, you'll probably be able to follow along through some of these examples later. Now, I don't anticipate necessarily that everyone on the call right now is going to be following me along, but if you watch this later, of course, you can pause it and rewind and do everything you want there. So the Power BI Desktop is the tool that we'll primarily be using through the course. But once we get a final solution in the Power BI Desktop, we'll be deploying that solution to the Power BI service. That service is a cloud-based subscription, okay, and it's actually oftentimes referred to as a freemium service. Freemium meaning that there are uh, versions of it that you can use completely free. Uh, but what that allows you to do is by deploying it to the Power BI service is it does allow you to share the results with others. It also allows you to schedule the data to be refreshed automatically. And so there's a lot of benefits to that. Now, don't get too scared off by the word cloud in here. That, that does scare people off initially for, for some, depending on your organization. Don't be too concerned with the cloud uh, idea here yet. Okay? Now, the, the idea of using the cloud here uh, does not necessarily mean you have to put your data in the cloud. Uh, it, it can be used as just a way to visualize the data and the, while the data still stays on premises. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the idea here, just to keep in mind, is the default behavior is it does push your data into the cloud by default, but you don't have to use that setting. Actually, settings that will allow you to use and leverage the data you have on premises and then be able to visualize it just through the cloud service. We'll talk more about that as we go. All right, then finally here, the Power BI Mobile. This is Windows, iOS, Android applications that allow you to uh, view your dashboards and reports that you've created through tablets and mobile devices. Like your iPhone, you can actually have things like notifications pop up whenever there's been a change in your data. So there's some things that you can do there that are really neat um, from mobile devices. And they're all native applications that are built out. All right, so here's probably one of the more important slides of the day. And this is really, and we're going to kind of move past slides here in a moment. We've got a few more here before we start to do our first demonstration. But um, the, this is probably one of the most important slides, mainly because it, it really tells you how everything fits together. Right? So you have things like going and get the data. You have actually organizing the data 
and let's, let's talk about each of these steps here. So the first step here in the process is a data discovery step. And so that data discovery step uh, is what allows you to go pull the data in from different data sources. Okay, so if you have data, like I mentioned, in Oracle or SQL Server or Mainframe, you can pull that data in through that data discovery step and you can apply business rules to the data using the transformations that are available to you in the Power BI desktop. The transformations that are available make it very easy to apply rules to the data so that it always pulls the data in the proper way. Once you finish that data discovery step, that first one, you'll move on to the data modeling step. And that data modeling step is important because that's actually where you'll take the data that you just extracted and you'll put it in a data model, which is for it, which is the, the purpose of that is to be able to create relationships between unrelated data sources. So think about the example I gave you. You have Oracle, SQL Server, DB2. I need to relate tables from each of those different subsystems. That can be done inside of a data model. Okay, it's kind of a semantic layer that's placed on top of the data that you have. The other benefits that you get from that as well is the data, the data modeling step is a very quick step. It's what actually allows the results to be able to process very quickly and to return back the results very quickly as well. Okay, and that uses an in-memory technology we'll talk about in a bit. You can also do things like build calculations through this step. So you can build calculations so that that way you have formulas like time intelligence formulas that allow your users to be able to do some more advanced analytics on the data. All right, then the next step, once I have the data model created, is to visualize the data. So take that data, place it into different graphs, charts, gauges, other visuals that are available to me, and be able to show my users really what we have in the data. Okay, so we're taking the data we extracted, organizing it in a model, and then visualizing it in the final step there on the top. Now, once you've created the visual, or visuals, and reports, you can then publish those reports to the Power BI service. And in the Power BI service, again, this is where you share the results. This is also where you can schedule data to be refreshed, or where you can do features like Q&A. Uh, Q&A is actually one of my favorite features of Power BI. This feature allows you to ask questions of your data. So if you have someone that doesn't really know how to query against a data set, but they know how to use a search engine, this is basically like using a search engine against your data, because you can type English questions into the, the, the Power BI service and it returns back reports or visuals based on the English type questions that you ask. And you'll see some of that at the end of the day. Finally, once you have a Power BI, uh, uh, once you've published the Power BI service, you create a dashboard out of the visuals. And any of the visuals that are added to your dashboard are now also available on the Power BI mobile applications that you download that we just mentioned on the previous slide. So you can see your data at any time on any device. Okay. All right, let's keep going here. Now we talked already briefly about the Power BI Desktop. I want to talk a little bit more about this before we move on. The Power BI Desktop application is uh, great because it actually combines a lot of the core features that Excel has done in the past uh, that were previously known as Power BI. Uh, so if any of you, I'm sure we have, we have about 800 people on the phone here. So if any of you guys have in the past done Excel Power BI, then you're likely familiar with the tools called Power Query, Power Pivot, Power View. Those tools have been combined into the Power BI desktop. So you, a lot of the people ask, right, well, why do they do that? Why don't they just keep enhancing what you can do inside of Excel? Well, the reason why they, they created a separate application is because there was a lot of roadblocks for people that were using Excel Power BI or people that were trying to use Excel Power BI. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it like this. If you have used Excel Power BI in the past, some of the roadblocks that were faced were that you had to have a certain version of Excel to participate. So things like you had to have Office Professional Plus. Um, for some of the tools like Power Map, you had to have Office 365, which not everybody has. Uh, if you wanted to even do Power Pivot, you had to have at least Excel 2010, and a lot of offices still run Excel 2007. So there was a lot of roadblocks for people being able to participate with Power BI. The other thing to be aware of as well is it was actually tying a lot of what the Power BI, Microsoft Power BI uh, product team was tied to what Excel was doing. And Excel doesn't have a, a, as, as frequent of an update process as the Power BI team needed. So having this separate application, this Power BI desktop application, which is completely free, by the way, there's no catch to that, it removes a lot of those barriers. And it also allows the Microsoft team to update it very regularly. Uh, you'll see about every month to two months, usually about every month, a new update that comes to the Power BI desktop application. In fact, there was one just about a week ago uh, that was that was added to the feed, uh, that was updated to the tools itself. So there, there, a week ago, if you, if you haven't updated your Power BI desktop application, 
then you'll want to go update it um, if you haven't within the last week. And you can go to PowerBI.com and you'll find where you can download it. But this is going to be the tool that we primarily use. There's a lot of visualizations in here. It combines multiple tools together to be able to solve our problems. All right, so let me give you a quick overview of this tool. Again, it's called the Power BI Desktop. You can download it from PowerBI.com. I'm going to launch it on my machine here as well. Okay, so I'm launching the Power BI Desktop right now. And you'll notice here once it launches, there is a 32-bit and 64-bit version of the tool. You'll notice once it launches, it does give us a startup screen here. This is just a little menu here to help you know what to do next. Uh, there are a couple short videos. The videos don't go incredibly in depth, but they do give you at least some guidance on where to get started. Uh, I wouldn't call them really formal training, but it gives you a starting point here. You'll also see on the left-hand side, over on this side, there's a couple buttons that you can work with, including this Get Data section here. This Get Data button will allow you to uh, start to pull in the different data sources that you'd like to be able to visualize eventually. Uh, if you've used the Power BI Desktop before, you'll see there's a Recent Sources here as well. And under Recent Sources is where you can start to pull in from data sources that you've already connected to in the past. So if you used the Power BI Desktop before, those connections are saved in here unless you later tell it you want to remove them. You'll also find a little bit lower here, it shows recent files. So these are ones that I've worked on in the past. These are actually for our boot camp class that we're working on right now. And uh, we're going to have that in June. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But um, this is what's going to show you any recent files that you've had in the past, or you can just come on the bottom here and open it. Uh, by the way, a lot of people ask this question. The tool that I'm using to draw on the screen here is called Zoomit. You can download it for free from sysinternals.com. All right, so I like that they give me the startup screen, but I really just want to get into the tool. And oftentimes people just kind of get click happy and they close this out anyway. So if you close this out, you'll see that this is the, the way that the application starts you. This is the way that you see the application begins uh, your way that you can use it. And uh, so what you can do, and really here's the three steps that we've talked about and what you'll need to be aware of how to get started here in the Power BI Desktop. There's three areas here I want to focus your attention in on, and I'm going to zoom in for this. The first area I want to focus your attention in on is this one here. Nope, actually it is a little bit further over. It's this one here called Get Data. You saw Get Data on the startup screen earlier. You'll also see Get Data here on the ribbon up at the top of the Power BI Desktop. This is really step one in your process. This is that data discovery phase that I mentioned on the slide deck earlier. Okay, so this is your data discovery phase to go get the data. Okay, it literally is called a get data button because that's where you're going to start. So step number one, right here, go get the data and the get data menu. Okay, and that's the data discovery phase that I mentioned in the slides a moment ago. The second step is identified on these two buttons on the left hand side here. This is going to be your data modeling step. And there's really two things I want to show you here, and this will really be encompassed by uh, one major theme, which is the step here is the second step, is once you get the data into the Get Data section, you'll do data modeling through these two buttons that you see on the left-hand side. These two buttons mean, are, are, have two different meanings here. One is the relationship view, okay? And the relationship view is where you'll actually start to create relationships between unrelated data sources that you have. So the example I gave before, you're pulling in uh, data from Oracle, you're pull, pulling in data from DB2. Those are two completely unrelated data sources, but you need to be able to create a relationship between the two. You'll do that but in the relationship view here. The other button that you see here, the one that looks like a table, is actually called a data view. And inside the data view, that's where you'll do things like create calculations. Um, you can create calculations in multiple places, but that's one way you'll do it. And it'll also allow you to actually view the data that you've imported previously. Okay, so it's a way to view what you see. The data view is where you can literally see the data. Okay, so that's step number two. Step one was go get the data. Step two is model the data. Okay, and you can do that through these two different icons you see on the left-hand side. The last button that you see on the top left is the report view. Okay, and in the report view is where you're doing the final step here, which is the data visualization step. So this is step number three in the process. It's called the data visualization step. And I'm running out of space here, so I'll just abbreviate data viz. This is the final step that you'll use where you'll actually take the data that you've imported, you've organized in a model, and you'll finally visualize in the report view. So that's kind of a quick understanding of all the stuff that you have here. Um, and you'll, you'll notice on the screen here is what, what we're, we're going to go through as far as steps today. Okay? So a quick introduction to the tool itself. Major themes here, though, are data discovery, data modeling, 
and data visualization are the three major steps that we're doing here. All right, great. So we talked a bit about the tool. Let's actually go back over the slides for a moment because what I'd like to do is talk about our next step uh, past the introduction here and actually getting into pulling some data in here. So this is going to be the data discovery portion of this. And uh, for those of you that are following me on the uh, Periscope app, I'm going to have to uh, stop it because I am running out of space on my, machine, on my phone there. All right, so the data discovery step, again, this is where we're going to go get the data. So let's talk about what that means. There are a lot of data sources that you can connect to inside of Power BI. Now, I've listed them here. I'm certainly not going to name them off, off to you. We only have three hours to talk to each other, and you know, clearly this would take a lot longer than three hours to talk about each of them. But just know if there's a data source you want to connect to, there is likely a connector built into Power BI for it. And if there's something you want to connect to that you don't see listed here, you can likely still connect to it because, oops, let me go back, because there is an ODBC provider here as well where you can actually connect. As long as you have an ODBC connection to a data source, you can then use that inside of Power BI as well. Okay, so there's a lot of ways you can get connected to your data. All right. Now, we're going to talk about several of these. Obviously, I'm not going to have time to talk about every single one of these in three hours, but uh, we will show you some examples of quite a few of these. We'll try and make it a little fun. All right. So what are the steps here to actually get started? Once you figure out a data source you want to connect to, you'll then go to the Get Data menu that I showed you on the screen a few moments ago. In the date, Get Data section, that's where you'll actually go to connect to a data source. You'll see in the screenshot I have here, you'll actually see it live in a few moments. But the screenshot shows you where you'll actually identify the data connection that you want to pull in from. You'll then specify whether or not you either want to load or edit the query. Okay, now if you select load, it's immediately going to take the results just as they appear and bring them into Power BI. Okay, so the load means pull the data in exactly how it is. Whereas the edit query option will give you the option to actually apply business rules to the data before you load it. So rather than just telling it that I want to load everything as it is, I can do edit query and apply some modifications to the data before I load it into my model. Okay, now we're going to talk about both of those steps, but just be aware you have a choice to make. Do you want to load it in as is, or you do, want, do you want to edit the query before loading? Usually you're going to want to edit the query. At the very least, you'll probably want to hit the edit query button so you can look and see whether or not you want to load it. Okay? Once you do the edit, edit query, that will launch open the query editor where you can do some data manipulation. And then finally, when you're happy with the data uh, and you want to load it into your model, you'll hit close and load to load that into a data model. Okay? And so we'll talk through those steps here now. So the first example that I'm going to show you here is a basic way to import some data into the Power BI desktop. The way I'm going to show you how to do this is through a file that I have, um, because as I imagine a lot of you guys work with files like Excel files, CSV files. You probably also work with a lot of databases. We'll show, uh, try and show a little bit of both. I, I think the database examples I have are probably going to have to get cut out for a three-hour example here. But uh, what we'll look at, and by the way, the database examples look very similar to an Excel file. You'll see here in a few moments. Uh, but what we're going to look at here is I'm going to connect to an Excel file that I have, and I'm going to use that Excel file as a data source, and then we'll use a couple other examples of data sources as well. All right, so to get started, if you remember from what I showed you on the screen a few moments ago, you're going to come up to the Get Data section. That's step number one to get started here. So I'm going to go up to the Get Data button up at the very top, and you can either click on the button itself, or you can notice here there's a little down arrow you can click on as well. If you click on the down arrow, it's going to show the most common sources that you have Okay, or if you click the entire button at the top section of it, it's going to launch another window here. Okay, so if I click the top section, it brings me a dialog box that shows me all of the different types of data connections that I can connect to. Um, I kind of use the drop-down box where it says most common because really the one I want to use is Excel, and that's considered a fairly common connector. Okay, uh, there are a lot of connectors in here. You saw on the slide a few moments ago that I had so many that the text even got fairly small on my screen. It was difficult to see them all. Uh, but there's quite a few here. So they did add a little search bar here to make it easier for you to find the, the connectors that you need. So if I needed to connect to, let's say, uh, SAP HANA, I can search SAP here and return back the results for just what I've searched. In my case, I just need to connect to Excel. So I'm going to search for Excel, even though it's at the very top here. And I'll select Excel as my data source and hit Connect. Now I'm just going to prompt me to go navigate to the file that I want to use for my data source. So I'm going to go find a file that I have uh, ready for this class. And it's actually going to be found in my class files. By the way, this is actually a portion of, a very small portion of a live class that we do as well. So if you're interested in some of the live training 
uh, or reported training that we do. This is an example from one of the classes that we offer uh, that's a 10 to 12 hour course. All right, so I've selected here a file, an Excel file, and I just found it inside my, my Windows Explorer, and I selected it, and I hit Connect. Okay, so all I did where there was found, found an Excel file that has some data in it. That could be any file that you have as well. Once you find a file you want to connect to, that'll bring you to a navigator pane here. Okay, and inside the navigator pane, you're seeing an example here of what it looks like to connect to some data. Now, the interesting thing about how this works is this, this visual, the, the way that it's visualizing the connection here is actually the same way that it visualizes connecting to a database. It's the same way it visualizes connecting to an Excel file or an Access database or a SQL Server database. Um, and that the very top level here is going to show either the file or the database name. And then below that, it shows all the tables or views, or in this case, the tables and spreadsheets that I have. So what you're seeing in this example is I'm connecting to an Excel file. And the Excel file has four objects that Power BI has found. All right, so let me tell you the difference between the types of objects that you see here. One of them you'll notice has a little table icon on top of it. That is an Excel table. It is literally an Excel table like you create a table, like, a, like any old table that you would create inside of Excel. As long as it has been identified as a table, it will have that little icon next to it that you see in the top two. The bottom two are spreadsheets. Even though I happen to label them with, a, with the word table here, these are actually just data that's inside of spreadsheets. So you have an option here to either select data from the table or from a spreadsheet. Now, the spreadsheet might have extra information in it that you don't want, so you can choose which, which one is more appropriate. Now, the nice thing about how this works is as you select the, the, the different options that you have here, so say, for example, I select product. If I select product, you'll notice on the right-hand side that it gives me a little preview showing me the data that I'm about to pull in. Okay, so I can get an idea of what I'm about to get myself into here before committing into it. If I like the data that I see here, and it looks like it's probably the data I want to bring in, I can hit the little checkbox next to the product table. And by the way, you can multi-select here. And I can either load or edit that data. Now, I mentioned this, this was in the slide a few moments ago where you can either choose to load or edit the data. In this case, I want to go ahead and edit it because I want to take data and apply some business rules to it first. But note, if I hit load, it's going to take this data and immediately bring it into my data model inside of Power BI. Okay, so I do have the option though. Do I want to apply some business rules to the data before I import it or just go ahead and import it? In my case, again, I'm going to click edit so that I can show you around the query editor for a few moments. So I'll click edit here. This is going to launch a query editor. So you can see on the very top here, the top of the ribbon where it shows and it calls it a query editor. Um, it actually opens up a separate window here. You'll see the Power BI desktop is in the background. The query editor is in front here for me. And so what you'll find in the query editor, and I'm, uh, by the way, I'm going to hit refresh here. You'll see that it, it actually does cache the results. If you've done this example before, I did this example six days ago. If I hit refresh, it'll bring me the latest version of the results. Um, that part's not really important for what I'm going to show you here. But what I do want to show you in this example is a little bit of navigation around the query editor. There's a lot of things in the query editor. It's almost like its own environment here. So it's, it's really important to get an idea of what you can do in here. The first thing you probably want to do is just bring back the column you care about. There's a lot of columns in here. You'll, you'll notice there's 26 columns in here. It tells me that in the bottom left. There's 26 different columns in here. And I don't really care about all 26 of these columns. I only care about, let's say, four of them. So if I want to remove the columns I don't care about, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can click on the columns you don't want, or you can actually click on the columns you want to keep, and you can tell it that you want to remove that. So an example of how I can do that is I can start to select a couple columns. I'm going to select the product alternate key here. I'll also select the product name by multi-selecting. Use hold down control, and you can multi-select columns here. I'll also select things like the product. Uh, let's go with the uh, color. I think I have a product color right here. And I'll also bring in the list price. It looks like I deselected a couple of those. Let me make sure I get all four of those selected. One, two, three, and four. And then if I want to remove all the other columns, it's pretty easy to do. All you have to do is right-click on one of those columns columns you have selected. It doesn't matter which one. Right click on one of the selected columns and select it to remove the other columns. And so it's going to leave me with just the four that I care about here for this example. Okay? So pretty easy to do. By the way, if you haven't downloaded the latest version of Power BI in a while, you'll notice I have this little indicator next to the column headers. That's telling me what the data type of the columns is. And I can also change the data types here very easily. That's a fairly new update, less than a week old uh, to Power BI. 
So what I've just done here is I applied a transform to the data set. I limited the number of rows that I'm pulling back to just, I'm sorry, the number of columns, not the number of rows. I limited the number of columns to just the four that you see here. And what you'll notice on the right-hand side of the screen is each of these different transforms or steps visualized here inside the UI. So for example, if I wanted to see what this looked like before I applied the last step, you can actually work your way back and forth in this applied step section on the right-hand side of the screen. On the right-hand side of the screen here, for example, you'll see remove other columns was the last thing that I just did. Uh, so if I wanted to, maybe, maybe for example, I made a mistake and I didn't want to remove any columns, I can click the little X that you find right next to that step and I can undo the last step that I just did. You can also edit the step if I clicked on the little settings button here, that will edit the last step that I did as well. The neat thing about how this works is you can actually work your way back and forth through the previous steps and that way you can see what things looked like prior to you uh, applying your step. So for example, if I want to see what things look like before I remove the columns, I can click on this changed type transform, that's the one right above it, and I can see what the data looked like right before I applied that step. So it allows you to kind of see a before and after view uh, of, of what the data looked like. Now you'll notice that this change type is not a transform that I placed in here. Power BI actually did that on its own. It automatically added in that step. Uh, there is a setting where you can actually turn off the automatic data type conversion. It's, you'll find it in the settings of the query editor. Uh, but that allows you, and, and what that shows you, I should say, is what Power BI is trying to do is implicitly interpret data types for you. So if it's not, if it, it, in some cases, it's not going to do that correctly. So you should always verify the data type so that it converts for you. But uh, just be aware that it does that implicitly by default. You can always turn off the changed data type conversion that it does automatically. That's something you'll find in the settings of this window that I'm in right now. So if I go underneath the options and settings, you'll find uh, a section here where you can undo uh, the data type conversions. Okay. So we've got a couple columns in here. This is looking all right. I, of course, probably want to rename these columns. If you want to rename columns, this is done very similar to how you would do inside of Excel or any other tool. You can right-click on the column headers, for example, and you can tell it that you want to rename a column. So I could right-click on this and just call this something like the product number. Okay. You can also just double-click on a column header to rename things as well. So if I just wanted to rename the English product name to just name, I could double-click on the column header and remove the parts of the name I don't like. So there's a couple of different ways you can rename. I, I kind of prefer the double click approach. It's a one less click I have to do. So if you do that, you just double click on the column header and you can rename it uh, where it sits. Okay, so I've got these columns renamed. If I'm happy with this, I can hit close and apply. Close and apply will actually take the results that we're looking at here and push it into the data model. Okay, and we'll talk more about the data model a bit later, but that's what the close and apply button is going to do is take the results we're looking at here and push it into the data model so we can eventually build some visualizations on top of it. The one last thing before I do that, though, that I want to make sure I point out to you is a best practice you should always be aware of is the name of your query that you've created. In this case, it's named my query products, which seems like an appropriate enough name, but you should always take a look at the name of the query that's created because oftentimes it will create queries that are called things like query one, query two, query three, and it doesn't give it very appropriate names. You'll, you'll actually see that in some of the examples we'll do later. So keep that in mind that you, you always want to go look at that and see is this named properly or do I want to go rename it? That'll be something that you want to do as one of your first steps, always a best practice to make sure that it names the query properly. Okay? All right, great. So we've got this first query taken care of. I'm going to hit close and apply. And that's going to take this data and push it into the data model. That's actually what you're seeing here, loading data into the model. And if I had any other uh, tables, it would attempt to create relationships between those tables if it found that one was required or one that, that made sense. All right, so that's kind of our first little example. Let's go back to the slides here. We'll talk about some more advanced stuff we can do as well. All right, I'm going to flip back over to our slides here. All right, so we talked about transforming data a bit. I do want to spend some time also talking about, uh, here we go, about the types of uh, more advanced transforms you can do. And we'll, we'll show some more basic ones here first before we go to more advanced ones. But I do want to spend some time talking about the types of transforms that are available to you through the UI. Uh, the user interface provides to you a lot of different transforms that you can do. You saw that I did a couple of them just by right-clicking on columns. That's usually the typical behavior. You can either right-click on a column or select a column and go up to the ribbon to apply a transform to the data. Uh, I'm giving you a list of some of the transforms that are available. There's obviously many more than I had, uh, had room to list here, so I just list some of the more popular ones that you might often do. 
Uh, but these are some of the transforms that are provided to you in the data discovery phase that you can use. Uh, one that I kind of want to highlight here for a moment, because I think it's one that is oftentimes underrated or, un or maybe underutilized because people don't realize they need to use it, is this one here called an unpivot. Some of you are probably familiar with what an unpivot does, but um, an unpivot is something that is, is often required, but you may not realize it. So what I'd like to do here with you for a moment is, is whiteboard a scenario that helps clear up what an unpivot does, when you might need it, and so that way it's really clear for everybody. So let me give you an example here, give you a scenario. Let's say that you're working for a company that gets data a lot of times from uh, vendors. Okay, So vendors send you a file, basically a little report that shows the results of uh, maybe you're a retailer and you sell, you sell uh, some of your products at Walmart, and Walmart gives you a data file every day uh, for each of the stores that has all sorts of information about the sales of your product. And so what they do is they, get, they output a file that oftentimes is really a report of the information. Uh, the government, think of the government. The government does the same kind of thing. If you've ever worked with like census data from the government, they oftentimes store data in a similar way as well. They send you what would appear to be a final report and they expect you to be able to work with that data. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Let's say that you're working with government data. And I, I give the example of working with census data here. So let's go with that. Let's say that you're working with census data. And the data that you're working with looks something like this. You have a year column, and then you also have columns like uh, states. You see a Florida column, you see a Georgia column, you see a New York column. And so I have you know, 50 different columns here for each of the states, plus one for the year in here. And so what the data looks like is something like this. So those are my column headers. Okay. And then inside of each of those rows, I have you know, data. So I see something like 2016, and what were my results for population? We're talking about census data here. And I, so I'm just putting some fake numbers in here. And then I'll have 2015, I'll have the values for that. Okay, you get the idea. I'm not gonna do any more than that. I'll just see, you, get, you kind of get the idea at that point. Now, the problem with data being stored like this is it's really not conducive for doing BI and creating reports on it. What you're looking at here is almost like a final report that's already been created. I would look at this and be able to see each of the states and how, how much their, their population is for each state. One of the major problems with this, though, is if I ever had to answer the question, what was the population for all states, I would then have to create a report where I drag in a column for every one, every one of the columns for the states and be able to create a visual that aggregates each of those columns as I drag each one of them. I, basically, I'm saying I'd have to drag in 50 different columns to be able to find out what the population is for the entire United States. So really, this data that is, is the way it's stored here now is not very conducive for doing BI and, and Power BI as well. So if I wanted to reorganize this data, I can use something called an unpivot. That's, that's kind of what I'm whiteboarding here. And I could take the data and reorganize it into something that looks like this. So I can have a year column, state column, and a population column. Okay? And so the data might look, it would actually increase the number of rows that I have, but it would be much better stored for creating BI solutions for it. So again, to give you an example, I'd have 2016, I'd have Florida, I'd have whatever the population value was for Florida. I also have 2016 for Georgia, okay, so you can kind of see the idea of what it's doing here is it's transposing the values that I have, and I'd have whatever the values were for Georgia, okay, and you get the idea. So I'm not going to keep going with this, but the next row that I would have would be 2015 and whatever the values were for 2015. Now the benefit I get from storing the data like this is uh, I can now bring in a column like state and should tell me, bring me back the population for all states in 2016 and I would know the total population for the entire United States. Or I could bring in the state column as a filter and just tell it that I want to filter by Florida, and that way I get just the population for Florida in 2016. So it's much better to be stored in this manner using an unpivot transform to be able to easily view the data. Okay, so this is called an unpivot. Unpivot allows me to transpose those columns in a rows and be able to much more easily work with the data in a report. By the way, there is a pivot transform as well. It basically does the opposite. So if you want to do a pivot, you can do a pivot by reversing that process and take data that looks like the bottom right and make it like it looks like in the top left. So there are a couple ways that you can work with the data uh, to be able to make it uh, form how you really want it to form. But typically for BI solutions, you're going to make it look like the bottom right. Okay, so that's an unpivot transform. 
Uh, again, that's one of the transforms that you have on the list. There's a lot of other ones that we'll, we'll talk about. We'll spend as much time as we can on this, but let's go ahead and, and move forward here. All right, so let's do a, a basic example here. And for this, this first example, what I'd like to do, and we'll do this example and then we'll take our first break. For this example, what I'd like to do is I'm going to go to a website called explore.data.gov. Okay, and this explore.data.gov website, this is a, basically data.gov. And it'll actually redirect you to a different website whenever you go to it. And we're going to go to this website, and we're going to find some public data that's out here. Many of you might have seen me do this example before in the past, but if, if not, it'll be new to you. Basically, what we're going to do is I'm going to play, play the scenario that I work for a major uh, bank. Okay, You can come up with whatever bank name you want to come up with, but I work for a major bank, and my, my job at this bank is to determine where the next brick-and-mortar banking center is going to be that we're going to build. Okay, we don't build a whole lot of brick and mortar banking centers anymore, so I want to make sure wherever I choose to build one that I choose wisely and I don't choose a place that um, is likely to, to have an economic problem in, in, in the future. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this website, data.gov, and I'm going to actually go pull in a list of all of the failed banks that have occurred in the United States over the last 12, uh, really 16 years. It's from 2010. I'm oh, sorry, 2000, excuse me. And so what I want to do is I'm going to go search in this data set search bar here for the data set called FDIC failed banks. Okay, and you can use, this is just their website that you can use and search. But I'm going to search for FDIC failed banks. And when I search for that, it's going to bring me back a list of data sets that I can use. You can see there's 15 different data sets that I can use for this example. All right, so I can choose this first one here, this one here called FDIC failed banks. That's the one I want to use. And what I would do in a typical BI solution, a more enterprise BI solution, is I would go find and download this file, put it on some share location I have in my environment, and then I would start to you know, pull this data in through my ETL process. So whatever my process for importing data into a data warehouse or whatever solution I'm doing, I would have to download this file and be able to, to use it over and over and over. The problem with that is that the, the file gets out of date, right? So new, new rows get added to this file, and I'd have to go download it again or come up with some automated process to download it. And so you kind of see the, the problem there. It's, 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 it's going to be create a manual process likely for me to download the file on a regular basis. The beautiful thing about how Power BI works is I don't have to download the file. I can leave the file exactly where it's at and just get a link to where the file is located, get a URL, get a, get a link to where I could, could download the file if I wanted to, and then point Power BI to the location where the file is on the website. So rather than downloading it, rather than having to uh, constantly re-update it, I can just point it to a link where it's stored. So to do that, I would right-click, not left-click, but right-click on the download link here and copy the address or copy the shortcut for where I would download the file. Okay, now if you're using a different web browser, it might say copy shortcut, mine says copy link address. Basically, I want to copy the, the URL for where this button would take me to if I clicked to download it. So I'll click Copy Link Address, okay? And I'm going to take that URL back over to Power BI now. So I'm going to go back over to my Power BI desktop. And I now want to pull that data in from the web address where I just got that URL from. Now, that web address is the, 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 one of the nice things about Power BI is you can actually pull data in from a website. Okay, whether it's data that's stored in a file or data that's just stored on a web page like in an HTML table, I can pull data in from it and make it part of my solution. So to get started with that, again, remember the same steps that we did before. The step number one to get data in is you go to the Get Data section here. So I could, again, I could hit the top part of the button or I could hit the down arrow, and you can see the most common data sources, including an option here called From Web. And this allows me to pull in data from any website that stores data in an easy-to-consume easy method. So I'm going to select web for my way to pull this data in, and I'll paste in the URL that I just copied from the previous screen. All right, now one thing to point out, it's important to note that the file that we're pulling in from, you'll notice it looks like it's pretty static. If you look at the file name, it doesn't look like a file name that's probably changing very frequently. There's no date appended to the end of it. There's nothing that, that seems like it's, it's unique about it. And why that's important is because if I were to go refresh the results, I need to make sure that the file stays in the same place. Uh, Power BI is not smart enough to know that, hey, the, 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 the website changed the name of the file. It doesn't, it doesn't know that the website changes the file. So having a, a file that's pretty consistent in name is, is actually important here. So just be aware of that. 
Now, there might be some scenarios where you can actually scan the, the, the page for the file name and, and use that as a way to determine which file to pull in, but it really depends on what the website exposes to you. All right. So, I've gotten now the file name that I want to import. I'll hit OK. It's now going to pull open and give me a preview of this data. So, I'm seeing a preview of the file and what the data looks like inside. I could hit load to pull this into my data model, but I'm going to click edit to take it to the query editor first. Okay. And what it's going to do for me here is it's going to bring this data into the Power BI query editor where I can start to do some manipulation to it. Now on the right hand side, you'll notice here that it has where I can actually change the name of the query. Remember I told you last time we did this that the best practice is the first thing to do is to change the name of the query. And here's why is because this query is called query one. And if I leave it called query one, then whenever we go to import it into our model, it's going to assume that we have a table called query one. So really, the first thing I should do is come over here and rename this. I'm going to call this failed things, okay? And we'll name it that. All right, so what I can do now is I can start to look at the data that I have here. I can do some manipulation to it, maybe remove columns I don't care about. Maybe I can manipulate some others, and I can start to adjust this to be a little bit nicer of a data set for building a report. So for example, there's a couple columns in here I don't really want. I don't really care about who acquired the bank, and I don't really care about what date the rows were updated. So I can select those two columns, right-click on either one of those, and tell it that I want to remove the, uh, uh, sorry, remove the columns. I, I, I want to get rid of the two I have selected. So I'll select remove columns here. And that leaves me with the five that I have left. Now there are some other things that you can do inside this editor where you can easily be able to manipulate the data. So, one of the things that's neat about the query editor is that it does do transformations of the data in a contextual manner. Uh, so what I mean by that is based on the data types of the columns, you get certain business rules that are based off the data types. Okay, so it, let me give you an example here. You'll notice here that my column here called closing date is a date data type. The way you can tell that is first of all, you'll see there's a little calendar icon over the column header. You'll also notice up in the ribbon that it says data type is date, okay? So it's telling me here what the data type is. Now because the data type is a date, I have some transforms that are contextual that can be used only on those types of column data types. So for example, if I were wanted to take this closing date column and just return back the year, maybe I don't care about the specific date that it was closed, I just care about the year. If, I, if that's the case, I can right click on closing date, go down to where you see transform, and you'll see the bottom five or six different transforms, the bottom five transforms here are ones that are specific to date data types. So again, how I got here is I right clicked on the column, went to transform, and then you'll see the bottom five transforms here are specific to the data type. So I could select something like, well, let's take this column and make it just the year. So I could do that, select year, and it only brings back in that case the year for that column, okay? So to show you what that's like, again, right-click, transform, and apply a year transform, and it's just going to return back the year here in that case. Okay? One of the things you might be curious about is, well, now I don't see the date column at all. Maybe I want to keep the date column and add the year column in addition to it. Well, if that's the case, you can always take a step back. Remember, you can hit the little X button inside the Applied Step section to undo your previous step. So if I click the X button right here, that will allow me to actually remove that last step that I just did, and it takes me back to where I was. So why would I want to do that? Well, let's say that I want to have both the date and the year as separate columns here. So what I could do in that case is I could right-click on the closing date column, so right-click on closing date this time, and instead of just going straight to do a transform, I could actually duplicate the column first. So I can make a copy of the column and then do my transform on the copy of the column instead of the original. So I'll select duplicate. Okay, there we go. And then I'll apply my transform on the duplicate column instead of the original. So I'll go now transform and select year on my duplicated column. I'll likely want to rename this to something like year. And then I have a good set there to work with. All right, so a good looking data set here. I think I'm pretty happy with this. If I'm happy with that query, I can hit close and apply. Take that back into the Power BI desktop to start visualizing the data. And what I'll do here as we start to go into our first break of the day it's just show you real quickly here what I could do with this, and this will give you an idea. Well, don't ask me questions on the visualization side yet because we will cover this, but just to get a picture of what my next steps might be is I might place this into some kind of a map where I want to visualize all of my failed banks that have closed over time. So what I'm doing here rather quickly is trying to create a quick little visual that allows me to see where all the failed banks are. 
And so you can see here already, very quickly, I was able to create a nice little report that shows me the failed banks by state. Looks like Georgia has the most failed banks at 92, Florida right behind it at 75, and then Illinois in third place. Coming up in third is Illinois with 66. So the neat thing about that, though, is you saw very quickly how we went from no data to visualizing data in a matter of a few moments here in that example. All right, so what I'd like to do as we go into our first break here, I have it's uh, 12 o'clock uh, Eastern time is I have a special offer I want to bring up to you and talk to you guys about. And I'm going to bring this up on my slide here. And it's a little bit about our on-demand training platform. So yes, this is a little bit of a sales pitch as we go into our first five minute break. Uh, but what I want to make you guys aware of is our special platform that we have. Our on-demand training platform is something that is really fantastic. It's a, a, a training platform. It's a learning management system that has training courses that you can get uh, there's actually up to 21 different training courses on it right now, all the way from Azure Machine Learning to DBA Fundamentals to T-SQL courses. There's three different Power BI courses, so if you're really into Power BI, the topic of today, I have three separate courses I can offer you. Uh, but there's 21 different courses in here. There's even one we have beta right now, a performance tuning course that's going to come up later this month. And what this learning management system allows you to do is it allows you to view training on your time. Rather than having to wait for us to have a scheduled class like today, you can actually come to a, a, a uh, on-demand class where you can view at any time you want. It works on mobile devices, and uh, we the special offer that we have today, we normally offer this at a price of $14.95 for a year, uh, but we have for anyone that's attending this, this online training and within the next seven days is you can get it for $9.95. So it's about 33% uh, uh, off, it's about uh, five, 500 bucks off basically to be able to get the on-demand training platform for a year. It gives you every course. We also sell the courses individually as well. Uh, if you'd like to buy individual courses, you can. But this is actually going to give you all 21 of the courses uh, for $9.95. And all you have to do is use the code POWERWEBINAR. That's the webinar that you're sitting in right now. And if you use POWERWEBINAR, that gets you a for, uh, that, that, that price for $9.95. And you'll find the on-demand training platform on our website. And if you have any more questions about it, you can certainly reach out to us. And you'll probably get a question at the end of this about follow up for that. So that's a special offer we're offering today. Uh, and it's available for you for the next seven days. So you can uh, certainly use that if you would like. Okay? All right. So uh, if you guys have any other questions about that, feel free to let me know. I'm going to go ahead and kick off a little timer on my screen for five minutes so you guys know when we'll be back. We'll be back in five minutes to continue on with our training material. See you guys in five minutes.
All right, guys, as we come back from break the last few seconds, I'm going to put back on my screen that promotional code just for uh, the last next 30 seconds here or so in case you were jotting that down. Uh, you will get a follow-up email on this, by the way. Um, I see some questions about this as well, so I, I'm going to do my best to answer some questions at the end. Uh, we'll also, uh, I'll, I'll do some follow-up questions via my blog. So I'll write a blog post with a lot of some of the, the top questions that are asked. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions that are asked more than once. Uh, but I'll write a, a blog post that follows up from the webinar that, that answers a lot of these questions because I'm sure there'll be, uh, there's already a ton that I just won't have time to answer. But uh, if you have uh, questions on this as well, I'll put this code back up on the screen. You should see it now. And uh, that offer, again, is good for the next seven days. Uh, I see some people ask questions about individual courses. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll certainly have some folks that can reach out to you if there are any questions you have on this as well. So uh, that should take us back into our material. So I'm going to come back into our environment here. And so what we're going to do next is start to talk about uh, what do we need to do for some more advanced stuff. So I've got some basic examples of pulling data in, but what are some of the more advanced things we can do with Power BI? So let's actually pull or pull the slide deck back up for just a moment here and take it back a few steps here. Um, one thing that's worth, worth discussing as well is this, this idea here called query folding. Okay, so we're getting back into material. This is right after our, our, one of our first examples here, pulling data into the, the query editor. Uh, but I want to talk briefly about the query engine itself and what it's doing behind the scenes uh, through this concept called query folding. Basically, the idea of query folding is pushing the logic of your query back to the server where your data source is rather than running it on your client machine. So think about it like this. By uh, a lot of workstations or a lot of machines, uh, if you want to apply transformations to your data, it will actually require you to pull all the data across the network and then apply the filters and things like that on the on Basically, the idea of query folding here is rather than doing something like that, rather than pulling, uh, well, let me give you a scenario. I think the better way to describe this is to do a scenario. Let's say that that has a billion rows in it, okay? It has a billion rows in it and its sales data, and really all you care about is the last year's worth of sales. You don't care about the last, not the last 10 years worth of sales. And so what you'd like to do is, is you want to apply a filter to that data so that you just bring back the last 100,000 rows, which is just the last year's worth, not all 1 billion of the data, rows of the data. And so the idea of query folding is rather than filtering the data on the client side, it actually filters the data on the server. That, mean, that means instead of bringing 1 billion rows and the not filter back, that's what query folding is, applying a filter using the native language of whatever the source system is. And now, there's a couple ways that you can do query folding. You won't, don't really have any control whether or not uh, this is occurring. It just occurs on its own. Uh, but there are some scenarios where query folding does and doesn't occur. So I want, I want you to be aware of those. does not occur on data sources that are not systems that have the nat a native source query language. So for, for example, if you're pulling in data from a CSV file and you want a CSV file, uh, then you can't do any query folding because there's no server for the query to be ran, run against. It's going to do it all on your client workstation. Whereas if you're doing a query against a SQL server, what query folding would do in that case is it would TI and interpret it as T-SQL and, and run the T-SQL query against the, the database and return back the data based on the T-SQL statement. Okay, so it actually takes what you do in the UI and converts it into the native source query language. Okay? Now, so it's not all data sources can be folded. I gave you an example just a moment ago, CSV. If I can't be folded, whereas SQL search databases could. Uh, uh, um, not all transforms can be folded either. So to give you an example of that, I think, um, something like the cap, cap function that's known, word, but that's not to use a transform like capitalize each word, is it would convert that, it would attempt to convert that, and when it sees there's no supported function for capitalize each word, it would apply that on the server, on the uh, client side. It would do that in, on your laptop or desktop. 
Okay. Now, some of the things with query folding go against conventional wisdom. So think about like this: if uh, for for most of you uh, that are from have more of an IT background, you you like writing queries, you like to write a query against a database, uh, you like to pull in data from databases, and if you like to do that, if you do pull in databases writing queries, that can actually be a negative when it comes to query folding. Um, when you write a query against a database with Power BI, none of that information will be folded. None of that query will be folded and pushed back to the server. So what that means is to you, it's almost better to just select a table inside of a database and then apply all the transforms inside of the Power BI editor, the query editor, and if you do it that, if through that method, it will actually push that and convert those transforms you apply in the query editor to the server. Okay? Uh, general wisdom is I'm going to write a query, I'm going to pull that query into this editor tool, and it's going to have uh, everything I need. But what usually happens is when you do that, you think of five or six other things you want to do to the query, and you start to do it through the UI. Well, unfortunately, none of the things that you apply through the UI are going to be pushed back to the server. So the key thing is, if you're going to write a query, if you decide to write a query against a database using the native source query language, that you include every, every possible transform that you want to do. Otherwise, if you just do something like a select star from a table, then all of that information is not going to be folded back to the server. It's just going to be imported across the network, all one billion of those rows, and then the filter would be applied on the client side. Um, I have some other webinars where I've talked about this much more in depth. The, cl the classes talk about this more in depth, and it shows some examples. Uh, but just be aware of that. That is a thing that's working in the back end. You don't have a lot of uh, other than that. Here before we move on is how you can actually start to combine data. If I wanted to have multiple data sources and combine those multiple queries, for example, together like that, you have three different ways you can combine data. You have a pen query. Queries. A pen query is kind of like a union and all. We'll put a result of data in a pen, two different result sets and add. Okay, that's the append option here. To add one data set to the other data set and you have a big list of the data. Okay, that's the append. Put one data set on the bottom of the other. A merge is kind of like a join. Okay, so you see merge queries is a join type of a function where it allows you to join and merge different queries together and have one result set where you take columns from, uh, let's say, data set A and columns from data set B, and you merge the results together using a merge query. There's a lot of different types of merge queries you can do, but you'll see them here in a few moments. The last one here is called combined binaries. And what combined binaries allows you to do is take a, a list of files. Let's say that you have a folder that has a ton of files in it. Okay. I gave you the example earlier. Maybe you are a vendor that sells your product at Walmart, and Walmart gives you a file every day for every store they have that sells your product. And if you wanted to take all of the files from a folder that stores those Walmart, that Walmart data and import it all at once, every one of those files at one single time, you can do that through the combined binaries option. It allows you to point it to a file folder and combine all of the data from all of those files in a single, uh, single method. Okay? That's combined binaries. All right, cool. So multiple ways we can combine data. We're going to talk about a couple of them here, but let's go ahead and move on here. Uh, I have a merge query slide. Tell you what, let's go ahead and actually see this in action, so that way you'll understand a little bit better of how it works. Seeing it in a slide is one thing, but seeing it in action is another. So let's go ahead and do an example here where we merge some queries together. All right, so I'm going to go back over here to my uh, web browser. And in my web browser this time, what I'd like to do is I'm going to search for another website that I have some public data that I like to use. It's called gapminder.org. And again, you might have seen me use this example in the past, but it's called gapminder.org. It's a website run by a university professor that has a lot of public data sets out here that are pretty interesting. And what we're going to do is we're going to go get some data that he's published on his website that has things like world health data. Okay, this is the university professor here. His name's Hans Rosling. He does a lot of things like uh, different different talks that uh, he's focused on data and, and kind of global misconceptions about data. So on his website, he has a section here called data. So I'm going to go here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in three different data sets that he has. He has a BMI data set. He has an income data set. And he has a population data set. And we might only have time to pull in three, uh, two, two of those three. We only really need two or three for, for this example. 
But I'm going to go get those three to two or three different data sets, frame them in separately, and then merge them together as separate results. All right, so if I go to the search bar here, I can search for the different data sets that he has. The first one we want to pull in is called BMI, Body Mass Index. So I'll select the BMI data set. You'll see there's two of them here. I'm Just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to select the one here for men. And rather than downloading that data, I'm actually going to copy the results from this file. Very similar to how we did our last example where we got the failed banks. I'm going to right click on the download link and just copy the shortcut for that link. Okay? So I've got the link of where that file is stored and I'm going to take it back over to my Power BI desktop. So I'll go back over to Power BI desktop. You can see the example we did a few moments ago. I'm going to get that out of the way here, at least for the time being. I don't need it in my uh, vision. And I'm going to go pull in data from this new data source by going up here to get data. Again, we've done this a couple times now, so I'm going to do this one a little bit faster. I'm going to go up to get data and select to pull it in from the web. All right, so I'll select web. Now, I'm going to paste in the URL. Very similar to how we did in the last example. I'm going to paste in the URL, and you'll see the URL is plugged in here. It is an Excel file. One thing I'll point out to you is this is a Google spreadsheet, which is kind of interesting. It does allow me to pull in data from Google spreadsheets here. All right, so I've got the data here. I'll hit OK. And because this is an Excel spreadsheet, it's going to launch open the Navigator pane, similar to how we saw in our first example where I pulled in data from an Excel sheet. I'll see the spreadsheet up at the very top, and then I see multiple, I'm sorry, I'll see the workbook at the very top, and then the spreadsheet shown below. Now for this example, as you might guess, the information that we want is in the one here called data. So I'm going to select the data sheet, and you'll see the data show up on the preview window here. So I'll select the data sheet and click Edit. All right, now there's a couple things I want to show you in this example, and one of those things is how we can do um, some additional transforms we haven't talked about yet. So first things first, though, I told you one of the best practices to do here is always to rename your query. So I'm going to come over here where it's called this query data, which is very generic, and I'm going to rename it BMI for body mass index. Okay? So I've selected and brought that data in. I'm now going to take the, the data that I have, and you'll notice that it looks like the first row of my data is probably my column headers. So what I can do is if I want to push the first row up into the column header section, is I can select the transform up in the ribbon here called Use First Row as Headers. And if I select that Use First Row as Headers, what it's going to do is it's going to push my first row up into the header name section here. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and select that, Use First Row as Headers, to push that up into the top section here. The other thing that I'd like to do as well is I want to take the data that we have in these columns and I want to convert them into rows. So let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. This is a classic example of an unpivot. Remember this thing, the, the example I did on the whiteboard on the screen here was I whiteboarded out census data. This is very similar to the census data example that I gave you earlier. Rather than seeing a column for each state, I see a column for each year here. And so what I'd like to do is I want to make those columns into rows and I should see a column here for country, a column called year, and a column called BMI. So I should have a total of three columns instead of the 30 columns that I have here right now. So a way I can do that is pretty simple. I can right-click on the country column here. So we're actually going to right-click on the column that we want left alone. I'll right-click on country. And you'll see there's an option here called unpivot columns. There's also another one right below it that we really want to use called unpivot other columns. So if I select Unpivot Other Columns, it's going to transpose those columns just like that, pretty, pretty quick. Many of you have seen this before. For those of you that haven't, that's pretty amazing how fast it did that. It's taken that data, and it's now transposed the columns into rows, and now it's something that's much more useful from our BI perspective. So I will rename the columns. I'll call that one Country. I'll call this one Year, and I'll call the final one here BMI. I'm also going to do a quick data type conversion. You'll see why I do this later. But if I want to convert a data type, there's a couple ways I can do it. You can right-click on the column is one way, and you can tell it that you want to do a change type. That's one way you can convert a data type. You can also come up to the ribbon here where it says data type, and you can convert it here as well. Or the new method that's just been added fairly recently is you'll see the little button here to the left of the column name. If you select that, you can change the column data type here as well. I'm going to convert this to a whole number. All right. You'll see why I'm going to do that here in a few moments. So I've got this first data set taken care of. I'm happy with the one that we've got so far. I'm going to go back to the website and get another one. So I'm going to go back to the website that we already have open. This time I'm going to search for income per person. All right, you'll see there's several data sets in here. The one that I'm going to use for this example is called income per person with projections. I'll right-click on the link again and copy the shortcut. Doing it a little faster this time because it's the same 
steps we've done now a number of times. All right, now, in the past, what you've seen me do is hit close and apply and push this back into the data model. What I can do this scenario, because I want to merge these three separate queries together, is I can, leave, I can stay in the query editor and actually go up here to new source. And new source is very similar to the get data button. Basically, it's the same idea as the get data button. But it, it doesn't require you to leave the editor that you're at to go select it. So I'm going to go click on new source up in the top and tell it that I want to pull in from the web again. Same way we did last time, I'll paste in the URL and hit OK. All right, so I now have two different data sources. Again, I'm going to pull in this one from the data tab here. And I'll hit the, make sure I hit the checkbox to actually get that data. And then click OK in the bottom. So I've now got two separate data sources. I know I did that one a little faster. That's just because it was the same steps that we've done in the past. Refresh there again. Okay. All right, so you'll also notice that as the same things we had to do in the past examples, we also have here, you'll notice the first row also has the column headers in it again. Okay, so remember how we fixed that problem last time? We went up to this Use First Row as Headers button, and I selected that to push the, the first row up into the header section. And then the, this next step that we did was we did an unpivot. Uh, remember how we did that? There's a couple ways you can do an unpivot. You can select the columns you want to unpivot, or you can select the column you don't want to unpivot, and you can right-click on it and select that you want to do an unpivot on all the other columns. That's what we did in the last example. So I'll do that again right-clicking on the country column here and select Unpivot Other Columns. All right, so we have the data very similar to how we had in the last example. I'm going to rename the columns. I'll call, call this one country. I'll call this one year. And I'll call this one income. It's average income, but that'll work. Okay. And the other thing that we did was we converted the data type of the year column. So remember how we did that was I clicked on the little button here next to the column, and I told it I might, wanted to make it a whole number. Now, the benefit of doing that data type conversion here is now it makes it a lot easier to apply some filtering to that column. So say, for example, I wanted to filter the year column to only return back rows from 1980 to, let's say, 2008. And the reason I'm not just coming up with that number out of nowhere, that's actually the, the, the data, that's the number of years of data that we have in the BMI data set. So if I want to filter this data set to match the BMI data set, you can do a filter by hitting the down arrow next to the year column, doing a number filter here and tell it that you want to do a between. There's other ones you can do in here, of course, as well, but I'm going to do a range and say that I want to filter the numbers or the years between 1980 and 2008. Okay, so we're doing a little filter of range of values here so I can return back the, an equal portion of values that we had inside of our BMI data set. All right, I'll hit OK. And that should filter down this data set. You can see the filter applied there. You'll notice a little icon appears here next to that column indicating that there's a filter. You'll also notice the filter has been applied because you can look over in the Applied Steps section on the right-hand side, and you'll see the last filter, or the last uh, transform we did was a filter bros uh, transform. All right, so I should also, of course, name this data set. We want to make sure we have some proper names for it, so I'm going to name this one Income, and I now have two different data sets. Now, for interest of time, and because we have a lot of other things I want to show you, uh, I'm not going to import the third one. We do have time for that in the, the live class and the recorded class that we teach. Uh, but for the purposes of the three hours that we have together, I'm going to leave the last one off here and just show you how you could, we can merge these two together. So if I want to merge these two queries together, you can do that by going up to the ribbon. Okay, this, rib, this is the ribbon up at the top, the thing that goes across with all the buttons on the very top. That's the ribbon. And you'll find at the very top of the Home ribbon, there is a Merge Queries button right here. And the Merge Queries button allows you to take two different queries that you have and join them together. Okay, Remember, merging is like joining. So take, take two different queries that I have and bring me three columns from this one and two columns from this one, for example. And then you can tell how many rows you want from each, depending on what type of join you do. You can also do here in a pen query, which is like a union all. Take one data set and add the other data set to the bottom of it. Okay, And then combine binaries, I mentioned in the slides, just like merging multiple files or appending multiple files together. Okay, That is not an option here because we're not working with files, not, not in the traditional sense. Okay, All right, so what I've got here now, if I want to merge from another query, I can click the Merge Queries button up at the very top. And it's going to allow me to merge my income query with another query of my choice in the bottom. So if I want to merge income with something else, I would select from the bottom that I want to merge it with the BMI query, for example. So I'll select BMI. 
And then I have to tell it how do I want to join these together, which columns are going to be the basis of my join. Now inside of the query editor here, you can merge on multiple columns. And as you might guess, as you look at these two different data sets, the income one and the BMI one, it actually requires two columns to finalize this join correctly. It's both country and year. And if you want to join on multiple columns, you do need to hold down control and multi-select country and then year. Okay? I'll do the same on the bottom. I'll select the country and then year to finalize my join between the two different queries. Now you'll notice as you do that, these little numbers appear next to the column names. These numbers are actually important. These numbers indicate which column is going to be joined to the other column in each data set. So for example, where you see two, two is going to be joined, joined to two, one is going to be joined to one year. All right. So just to be clear, that's kind of the idea of what you're seeing here. You don't want one joined to two. I don't want a year joined to country and country joined to year. Those numbers should match up to make sure the join's done properly. Okay. There are quite a few joins in here. We'll, you know, when we have more time to talk about this in the lengthier class that we have, we talk about each of these joins in much more in depth. For the purposes of what we have today, we're going to do an inner join. And basically the idea of the inner join is just bring me back rows that match in each of these data sets. So if I find a row that exists in BMI but doesn't exist in income, it's not going to return back the results. And vice versa is also true. If I find a row in income that doesn't exist in BMI, it's not going to return back the results. It's only going to return back results that have matches. There's also things like left outer joins, right outer joins. Uh, there's some other ones in there that we can we have more time to talk about in our other classes. But basically the idea of those, like a left outer join would say, bring me back everything from income and then just the matching rows from BMI. So you could have potentially income rows that don't exist in the BMI rows. Okay? All right. So in this case, though, I only care about ones that match in both data sets. So I'll do an inner join and click OK. All right. Now when you do a merge, here's how it handles merging queries together inside of Power BI. You'll notice the original query still shows. The income query is still here. But you'll also see that a new column has been added. And this new column shows you a little nested table here. You'll see when I select the cell, it actually shows me the, the, the join that takes me to the BMI query. But really what I want to do is I want to add the BMI column to this data set we're already looking at. So if I want to do that, I can hit the little ellipses here. I'm sorry, not the ellipses. I can hit the little expand button at the column header. And when I hit the little expand button here, what it'll allow me to do is tell tell Power BI which of the columns I want from the other query. So I already have country and year from the query we're looking at now. So really all I want is the BMI, BMI column. Excuse me. I already have all the other ones. Just bring me back BMI. And then you may also want to uncheck this option. This option here says use original column name as prefix. Basically that's saying that if I leave that checked, it's going to call this column new column dot BMI because the column name right now is called new column. So I usually recommend unchecking that unless you think there's potential that you might have more than one column with the same name. All right, now I'll hit OK on this and that'll now give me the BMI column that's now been added in with income. And I now have these two different queries merged together. I'm ready to now take this and go visualize it in some uh, report now. Now, one thing I should point out to you before I do that is because I've merged these two queries together, you may not necessarily necessarily want to import the data from the BMI query. Keep in mind, we still have BMI here. You'll see on the left-hand side, here's all the queries we've created so far in this class today. I have the product query that we started off with, the failed banks query, the BMI query, and the income query. Now, you, you know now that the income query actually combines both income and BMI. So if I have a query that combines both of those, then you may want to get rid of the first one. Now, you can't outright delete the first one. The, fir the first BMI query has to stay here. But what you can do is you can tell it that you don't want to load the results into your data model. All right, let me, let me again describe what I'm saying here. Is if you notice here inside my income query, I've now combined both income and BMI. So why also import BMI? I don't need BMI as well. So if I don't want to import the data from BMI into my data model, you can right click on BMI here and you can uncheck this option here called enable load. And basically what that does is it stores the query itself but it doesn't actually load any of the data into the data model. So the idea would be I'm just storing the query, I'm taking the results of the query and bringing it into income, and I'm going to import the data from income but not from the BMI query because I don't need both of them. That would be a little redundant. So I'm going to uncheck enable load on BMI, and when you do that, you'll notice here that the BMI is vis visibly different. It has a little italicized and gray text to it 
that tells you that it's not going to load the data from that query. It's only going to load the data from the other ones that have the kind of white text and not italicized. And again, the purpose of that is I don't need the BMI query because I've already got it merged with the income query. All right. So with that result taken care of, I can hit close and apply. And with that close and apply, it's now going to import, you'll notice here, just the income query. It doesn't import BMI because BMI is not required. I already have BMI merged with income. But it'll take that data, it'll bring it now into my reporting interface, and you can see on the right-hand side, I can start to bring in the different, the different columns that I have from that data set and start to build out some reports. So really neat interface here. You can do something like this. Just to give you an idea of what I can do here with this, now, I could bring in my, my years, let me give you an idea of what you can do with this, just so you can kind of get a picture of how powerful this is. I'm going to bring in uh, this as a line and check this out. So what we're looking at here is by year, okay, by year I'm looking at income as my columns. Okay, so my column chart here is showing income. So there's a steady increase in income for, really this is the entire world here. And then BMI is also increasing over time as well. Now, what I may want to do is bring in some kind of filter so I can see things like uh, which countries are involved. You know, how, how does uh, you know United States compare to, let's say, India, for example? I can do some comparisons here of, of world data by filtering. Now, we're going to spend some more time talking about the visualization side of things as we move on. But uh, let's talk now about data modeling. So I'm going to go to our next section here we're going to spend some time talking about modeling the data. Oh, I should bring up real quickly, one, uh, one thing that a lot of people have questions about before we move away from the data discovery section here is how do I go back and edit queries once I create them? You'll notice up top here where it says edit queries. That'll take you back to the query editor that we were looking at before. And um, th there's actually some code behind the scenes that's being generated every time you do something inside the query editor. You can find that code if you click on the advanced editor right here you'll notice there's an advanced editor and you can see the code behind the scenes. The code that's written behind the scenes is called M. This is M query. And I actually had a session that I did for us in the past that was a full hour just on M queries where we talked about how you can write your own, how to read this kind of code, what is it doing, how do you make it uh, dynamic and parameterized. There's a lot of things you can do that's pretty fun with M queries once you get a little bit more advanced. Okay, but this is where you can actually go find the code itself. Uh, one thing, let me show you this real quickly. One thing you can do, if you're trying to learn in queries, what I did here was I created a blank query. So I went up to new source and did a blank query. One thing that's kind of neat that you can do if you're trying to learn in queries is you can actually go to the formula bar here and say pounds shared. Let me show you what that is. Pound shared, this is a little tip. If you take notes, write down pound shared. Because what that'll do for you is it'll give you a list of every function that M, M has available to it. And, it's, and the mQuery language is a, a language for applying transforms to data and importing data. So you'll see there's a lot of different types of functions that you can choose from. And if you look at each of these and select one, for example, let me select this one, you'll see that it does give you some examples on how to use it. It gives you some templates on how the code should be used. And in some cases, it even gives you multiple examples, just depending on which one you happen to select. It gives you quite a bit of information about each of the functions. That's pound shared, equals pound shared to do that. I'll also point out to you here that M query is case sensitive. So you, you want to make sure you do lowercase s on that shared if you want to be able to do that. All right. Very cool. So let's move on and talk about data modeling. So the whole idea behind taking your data and putting it into a data model is multiple, there are multiple reasons why you do that, multiple reasons why it's important. Uh, one of those reasons why it's important is because it can ex uh, help performance of the data results uh, extremely. It can, it, can, it can be significant performance enhancement to put data into a data model. The reason why is because it's, in, it's using an in-memory technology called X-Velocity. And that X-Velocity engine that's running behind the scenes uses the memory on your machines to be able to store and return back results very quickly. In-memory technologies help in multiple ways here for Power BI. It helps make the data itself highly compressed, where it's not storing nearly as much, it's not taking up nearly as much disk space whenever you're creating and building out results. It's also helpful because it's extremely fast to return back the results because it's highly indexed to be able to return back the results for you. It's also much quicker to do development. So if, as, we're, as we're talking about this data, in, the data modeling engine, it's much quicker to, to do this rather than just importing data into like a regular Excel uh, file, which we'll, we'll talk about as well. 
All right, so very briefly, I really talked about this already at a high level. The X velocity engine is going to compress the data at a very extreme rate. The data will be compressed. It's also going to make it so that the data returns back very quickly because it's highly indexed. I spend a good amount of time talking about this in our, in our other class. All right, so let's actually talk about creating a data model. So as we talk about creating a data model, we of course should know what a data model is. A data model is really just a combination of tables and relationships that you have. So this goes back to the idea of I have data that's stored in Oracle, I have data that's stored in SAP or DB2 or a SQL Server, and I need all of those different data sources related together. That can be done in the data model. The data model serves as, as the semantic layer that sits on top of the actual data sources that gets you ready to actually build reports on top of it. Okay, so it's a series of tables and relationships. All right. So as we create out our data model, there's a few usability enhancements that I'll show you how to do. Things like renaming columns and tables are fairly simple to do in the data model. Uh, you'll also talk about how to hide columns and tables. There's going to be some cases where you will want to hide some columns. And then also dealing with sort order issues. I'm going to show you some issues as we create the data model that show you problems with the sort, excuse me, the sort order of our data. And I'll give you a few examples of that. All right, now when it comes to table relationships, there are some methods that auto-detect relationships between tables. It'll, it'll determine or it'll attempt to determine relationships based on the data source that you're pulling in from. If it has those relationships defined in the data source, oftentimes it can detect that. It'll also look at things like column names. If the column names are the same, it will make some assumptions on the relationships and, and create relationships for you. Should you always follow those relationships? Absolutely not. You should always verify relationships that it creates for you. And a few of the other things we have on the slide we'll talk about as we get going deeper into the examples. All right, you can also create things like hierarchies. So hierarchies are really neat because what they allow you to do is organize data, make it easier for you to find the data you care about. So for example, I've, I have in the picture here on the right-hand side a hierarchy that allows me to drill into a year, drill into the quarter, drill into the month, all the way down to the day level. So let's picture this like a product hierarchy. I can drill into the category of the product, then the subcategory in the product, and then the actual product name itself. Or another example, maybe I drill into a geographical hierarchy, find the country, then drill into the country and see the region, and then drill into the region and see the cities. So it allows you to more easily navigate the data, and it makes it much more interactive when it comes to the reporting layer you'll see later. All right. So let's actually walk through the process of creating our first data model, and how do we create relationships and things like that as we go through this first example. All right, so I'm going to close out of our query editor for this. I can do that by going to the home ribbon here and hitting close and apply if I want. Uh, I can also just hit the close button in the top right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit close and apply here. Okay. And what I'd like to do for this example is I'm going to go start as if we were doing this from scratch. In fact, you know what I'm even going to do? I'm going to close out the instance that we have so far, and I'm going to open up a brand new Power BI desktop instance. And you can see my messy desktop here. Uh, but I'm going to open up a new instance here, so that way we will be able to see from scratch a beginning to end scenario of how we can do this. You've already seen some many, like very small beginning to end scenarios where I've taken some data and visualized it. Let's go through the process, the process a little bit more in depth. All right, I'm going to close out the startup screen and select get data again. And this time we're going to pull in from a different data source I don't see listed here, so I'll select more. All right, now for this one, what I'd like to do is I'm going to pull in data from an access database, which you'll see right here, okay? And the reason I'm doing access as a data source is really, it could be SQL Server, access doesn't matter. I'm just choosing access because it's kind of an easy connector to get into. So I'll select access and hit connect. And for the example for this class, I'm going to pull in data from a... Uh, an access database, but it's an AdventureWorks access, access database. Many of you guys are familiar with AdventureWorks. It's a bike retail example. It's fine for what we're using. It's really more something, a, a good learning tool that we're going to use for this class. So I'm going to select AdventureWorks DW and hit open. So I'm finding the access file, the access database, select open, and that'll bring me to a, a place where I can actually select the tables that I want to bring in to Power BI Desktop. So this is what it looks like to connect to a database. You'll see the database name up top, very similar to how we saw when we connected to Excel. We saw the Excel file up top. And then I see each of the tables listed below that I can connect to. For this example, the, the tables that I want to connect to are going to be the product table. I also want to connect to the uh, customer table, uh, the date table, 
And there's a few other ones I want to bring in here as well. The sales territory table and also the internet sales table. So I'm going to select a few tables here I want to connect to. There's five different ones that I want. And I'm going to multi-select them just by selecting the checkbox for each. Uh, I just happened to glance over and saw a quick question. Would it show views here as well? You would see views here as well. If I was connecting to a SQL Server database, you would see views. Uh, in this case, the access database, are, there's not, not, not listed for my, my particular access database. So I'm going to select those tables and then in this case, I'm actually happy with how the data is stored. Remember in all the examples we've done previous to now, we went into the edit uh, tool and that took us to the query editor. In this example, I'm going to go ahead and click load and just bring this directly into the data model. You guys have seen a number of examples of the query editor. Let's actually focus in on the data modeling aspects here for this next several demos. So I'll click load and it's going to immediately bring all five of those tables into the data model here for me. So you can see it's connecting, it's now importing that data in, and you'll actually see a number of rows that are imported there very quickly. It popped up and then it went away very quickly. Now one of the things to be aware of when it comes to Power BI, you do have options where you don't necessarily import the data into the data model. That concept is called direct query, and there's certain data sources that have direct query connectivity uh, abilities. So things like SQL Server, uh, Oracle, SAP HANA even has some uh, capabilities of this now, where you can connect to the live data source and it does not import the data into the data model. That allows you to uh, easily be able to bring in data that's live and you don't have to refresh the data because it's always pointing to the live data source. That's called direct query uh, and I'll, kind of, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later but I want to at least give you an idea of you, happen to, you have an option where you don't necessarily load the data into the data model, you just point to the live data uh, as an option. It depends on which data source you're using uh, on which actually allows you to do that. A quick question I glanced over and saw, how does direct query impact performance? It can hurt performance of the reports because again, imagine you're actually pointing to the direct data source, whereas the data model itself is using an in-memory technology to return back the results. So using the data model can be faster, it's just going to be not uh, the most up-to-date version of the data because it requires you to refresh it either through a manual process or through a scheduling process, which we'll talk about later. All right, let's move on. So I've got this data now into my data model. You can see right now I'm looking at the report view. Uh, a couple ways you can tell this is the report view is you can see there's visualizations I can select here. There's also, I'm, I have the report button selected on the left-hand side. And, but what I'd like to do is I actually want to start to show you some of the different things you can do from a data modeling perspective to enhance the model for building reports on top of later. Uh, one of the things that I want to do first is create relationships between the tables that did not uh, automatically detect relationships. So for example, if I want to show you where you can actually see relationships between the different tables, I will go over to the relationship view, which you'll see the button for right here. If I select that button here, that'll take me to see the relationships between the tables. So I'll select that. And I can see that it looks like several of the tables automatically have the relationships interpreted. This last one over here called dem date, or dbo underscore dem date, did not interpret the relationship properly. So I need to actually manually create that one. And that's intentional. I did that on purpose so I could show you how to do it. It's actually pretty simple to create relationships. If you want to create a relationship between two tables inside the Power BI desktop, you find the columns that the relationship should be based off of. So that would, of course, require you to know a little bit about the data. In my case, I know that my full day alternate key column here is the basis of my relationships. And I know that I want to relate that to a column that I have inside my sales table called order date. So these two columns and these two tables are what I want to relate, base my relationship off of. To create a relationship between those two tables, you simply click and drag one column on top of the other to create the relationship between the two columns. So I'll click and drag one on top of the other. And you'll see the line now show the relationship between the two. You'll see there's a many to one relationship, meaning there's many order dates inside the sales table to one instance of each order date inside the date table. The many to one here is represented by the, the number one, and the star symbol here is many instances of order date inside of the fact that they're in a sales table. So there, that's one way you can create relationships. There's actually several different types of relationships that we spend more time talking about in our full version of this class, uh, but that's really all the time to cover on relationships for the basis of getting started here. So drag and drop to create it. That gives us a relationship. Now we can actually analyze all of the date fields that we have based on the sales metrics that are inside the internet sales table. The other thing we would likely want to do is also rename some of these tables. You see a lot of these tables have pretty terrible names because they came from 
a data warehouse. They're prefixed with the word dem or fact. And that prefix makes it where it could be a little bit confusing to end users. So if you wanted to rename a, a table name, you can do that by either double clicking on the table name here. So I could double click on it and I could remove the prefix and put spaces in here. Spaces are okay to add inside your table names. And you can do that in each of these tables. I'll do that real quickly here. All right. And so I'll do that on each of these until I finish it. There's, by the way, you can rename the tables in multiple places. This is just one of the places you can rename it. You could also rename it in the data tab or in the report tab. Either of those other buttons up top here on the top left wall, I had to rename columns. But what I'd like to do now that I've renamed these is walk through some of the other usability enhancements and some of the other problems that I really need to solve them as we're talking about our data model. One of those problems, for example, is the sort order of our data. So let me show you, and, and I'm going to display a problem to you, and I want to walk you through how to solve this problem, because this is really a co common problem that you'll run into. To show you this problem, I'm going to go over to the report view here for a moment. We've got the relationships created. We renamed our tables to be something more appropriate. By the way, you can rename each of the columns as well to add spaces in the columns. I would also re uh, recommend hiding some of the columns. So for example, the, the key column relationships, these relationships that are, the are these columns that are the basis of our relationships, they probably aren't something that you necessarily want to place inside of a report, but you might, you, you need them because that's what's holding up the relationship between the two tables. So you can certainly hide columns if you want simply by right clicking on them and telling it that you want to hide it in the report view. And basically what that does by hiding it in the report view, which I can do on either side of the tables here, basically what that does is it makes it so that the users don't see it, but it is hidden. So whenever I go to build some reports on top of these tables, it doesn't have such a big list of, of columns that they don't even need. It kind of narrows down the list. And it's fairly simple to do. You just right click on a column and select hide and report view. Okay. You can also hide entire tables, by the way. So if you had a case where you were doing something like a many-to-many -many table, a many-to-many -many relationship, you could right-click on an entire table and hide the whole table if you wanted to. All right, that's it for, for that. Just want to show you that usability problem. But the next thing I want to show you here is another usability problem, which is the sort order of your data. So we have this date table over here. And what often happens, specifically with date tables, but it can happen in other areas, is our dates don't necessarily get sorted the proper way. So let me show you uh, and visualize this problem to you. I'm going to go to the report view. Okay, so I select the report view in the top left. And from my date table, I can expand it on the right-hand side and expand the field list and see all the columns I have inside the date table. Now you kind of see why it's important to hide some of these columns because it gets a little out of hand here. But uh, I'm going to bring in the English month name column. This is just a list of the month names. And I'll make this a little larger so you can actually see it. There we go. That should be a little easier to see. We'll talk about how to do that in a bit. In a bit, But you can see a list of all of my months, and you can hopefully see a problem with my list of months in that it's sorting it alphabetically, and it's not sorting it chronologically. Like I would expect to see January, February, March here. It's sorting it April, August, December, February, so on and so forth. So this is a common problem where it's sorting data one way when I really want it to sort another way. And Power BI has no idea that I want to sort months that way because to, as far as Power BI is concerned, this column is just text. So how does it know that it wants to sort month a certain way? It doesn't know. So if I want to fix this problem, though, I can do that by uh, selecting the field that we just brought in. That's the English month name column. All I have to do is select it over here on the right-hand side. You can see I just selected it. Don't, you don't necessarily have to check it. You just select it. And with it selected, you can change the data model to actually sort it by another column. Okay? So let's say, for example, I want to sort the month name by the month number. So I want to sort January by the number one, and February by the number two, and March by the number three. You can do that inside of Power BI. You can tell it that these values should be sorted by different values. And so if I wanted to do something like that, I can select the English month name column here, go up to the modeling tab up in the top ribbon, so select modeling, up in the top ribbon, way up top, and you'll find in the modeling ribbon there's a few buttons that you can do here, a few, few options that you can select, I should say. And one of those options here is a sort by column property. And so what I can do is I can tell it that I want to sort this column we're looking at right now and the column I have selected right now by a different column. So I'll tell it I want to sort the English month name not by the month name, but actually by something like the month number. You'll see there's an option here called month number of year. 
and you can select that and, and basically that tells it, I want to sort this column by this column. Okay, so I want to sort the month name by the month number. And when I select that, you'll notice that the impact happens immediately. Immediately, you'll actually see the results where the month is now sorted properly. Okay, so that's one of the things you'll want to fix as well. Another thing that's probably important to you is things like hierarchies. We talked about hierarchies in the slides a few moments ago. If I want to create a hierarchy, that can be done fairly simply from, from the report view that we're looking at right now. And if I want to create a hierarchy on, let's say, the date table, for example, I can go look over on the field list on the right-hand side. Okay, so again, the idea of hierarchies are basically you're creating one object that includes multiple columns. And those multiple columns allow you to drill in deeper and deeper into the data. So if I want to create a hierarchy on date, for example, I might want to drill into the year 2015 and see all the quarters within 2015, so one, two, three, four, drill into quarter one and see January, and drill into January and see all the dates within January. That's the idea behind a hierarchy here, is it makes it much easier to navigate and drill deeper and deeper into the data. So if I want to create a hierarchy, I can do that by going over to the field list on the right-hand side. Find the table that you want to create a hierarchy on, and more specifically, find the column that you want to create a hierarchy on, and right-click on that column. So for example, if I want to create a hierarchy that begins with a calendar year right here, I can right-click on calendar year and select that I want to build a I want to place it into a new hierarchy. So I right-clicked on calendar year, selected new hierarchy. By the way, this doesn't, this doesn't have to be on a date field. This can also be on something like a customer hierarchy or a product hierarchy. You can have hierarchies for anything you want. It just helps you navigate through the data better. So I have a hierarchy here called calendar year hierarchy now. By the way, you can rename that. If I wanted to rename that, I can right-click on it and select rename. And maybe I want to call it something like uh, date drill down something that's more user-friendly. All right, so I right-clicked on, on it and renamed it to Date Drill Down. And you can see in this case, there's a little arrow next to it, and that arrow indicates that there's more than one field that's part of this hierarchy. In this case, right now, I only have one field. So if I want to add others to it, I can go find other fields I want to add in. So for example, I have Calendar Quarter here. If I want to add Calendar Quarter to it, I can right-click on Calendar Quarter, and I can choose whether or not I want to add this to a new hierarchy. So you can have more than one hierarchy or I can add this to an existing hierarchy. So I can add this to a, uh, the, the date drill down that we just created a few moments ago. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to add this to the existing hierarchy we already created. I'll select Add to Date Drill Down. You'll now see there's two fields in the date drill down. One's calendar year, one's calendar quarter. By the way, you can rename these as well. So I can rename the individual fields here, and I can call this one just year if I wanted to. And I can call the other one just quarter if I wanted to. Okay, so you have the ability to do that. Let's add one more field to this. Let's also add English month name. If I right-click on English month name, right-click on it, and tell it that I want to add it to the date drill down again, you'll now see there's three fields in here. I can rename each of these. I can call this one month. I can call this one quarter. Try that again. There we go. And I can have each of these rename something proper or maybe more user-friendly. So that way, whenever I go to bring in the date drill down, like my users can drill deeper and deeper into the data. Let me show you what this looks like. If I select something like the date drill down here, you'll notice it brings it into my field list. And let me visualize this as a, a matrix here for a moment and increase the text size so you can actually read it. You'll notice that it allows me to see a bit of a drill into my data. So I can see the year, the quarters, the months. And all I had to do was select the one hierarchy and it brought all of those through automatically for me. So that's kind of the idea of the hierarchy. And this is all encompassed in building the data model. The data model, yes, includes creating hierarchies. It includes uh, creating relationships and creating sort orders. And it also includes creating calculations, which we're going to talk about next after our next break. So before I send you to break, I, I do have one other thing I want to tell you about here. I showed you guys earlier about our on-demand training platform. If you, uh, you know, we actually, we, we realized that not everyone uh, trained differently. Some people like to have training on their own time through on-demand training. Other people like to do more in-person training where they can actually have a live person to talk to, they can ask questions, they can uh, interact with them, they can have, be more hands-on with an instructor there. And so we realize that. We realize everybody trains differently. So we have multiple types of training. In addition to the on-demand training platform I talked about before last break, we also have another type of training called a boot camp. And our boot camp training that we have is a deep dive into Power BI. We actually have a boot camp for data science. We have a boot camp for traditional enterprise BI. 
And then the boot camp I'm bringing up with you guys today is a Power BI boot camp where we spend about 30 to 35 hours focused and on building out BI solutions or specifically Power BI solutions. And you do that in person here with me in Jacksonville. This is actually a class I will be teaching in Jacksonville in June. And uh, we're offering, because you're attending this, this uh, training seminar today, 20% off using the code POWERBC. So Power Bootcamp or POWERBC, if you enter that code in, that code called POWERBC will get you 20% off on that Jacksonville Bootcamp that's going to be in June. And we have uh, some slots still open for that. If you're interested in that and you like what you're seeing with Power BI, you can come visit me in Jacksonville and, uh, and, and go more in depth than what we have time to do in three hours. We can do it in 30 to 35 hours. So I'll leave that up on the screen here for a few seconds. If you're interested in that, you can, of course, uh, ask me questions about that via email or via chat. Uh, and we'll also, uh, like I said before, we'll be emailing you guys once the webinar is over. Uh, some follow-up on some of these offers. If you're interested in them, you can, of course, uh, participate. You have uh, seven days after today to be able to participate in this uh, boot camp offer. Okay? So we'll go ahead and do another five-minute break. I'll come back, and uh, once we come back from break, uh, we'll continue on with the last section of the class, which is where we're going to talk about creating calculations. We'll also look at doing things like um, building visualizations on the reports and finally publishing it off to a service. Okay, so I'll see you guys in five minutes.
All right, as we're coming back from break here, I do want to give you that timer so you guys know when we're coming back, but uh, about 30 seconds left here. I'll leave the offer up here for a few more moments. Uh, again, just a little bit about this boot camp that we're doing. This will be taught by me, uh, and it'll be in our Jacksonville office. office. It's a, a deep dive where we cover really everything we're covering today, but obviously much more in depth. It's, it's 30 to 35 hours worth of content. And one of the things we're doing on the final day of that, Friday of that class, is we're letting folks bring their own data. And so we're trying a different concept with this course where, yes, we have a, a scheduled data source that we're going to be using throughout, uh, but we're also going to let you bring a couple of your data sources that you have from work. And, uh, you, of course, you probably you might not want to share that with other attendees, but you'll have the instructor, that'd be me, uh, there next to you to help you and, and kind of guide you through uh, creating solutions on top of it. So um, that's something that we're going to be doing. Again, that's going to be in June in Jacksonville, Florida. So if you uh, want to come to sunny Florida in, in June, you can certainly do that. And uh, join me. We're giving, like I said, 20% off on that boot camp uh, for the next seven days. All right, guys. Well, I, this is great so far. We've had a, actually a lot of people. It sounds like a, just looking at the numbers of folks that are in here, a lot of you have carved out your day for this. So I'm really excited that you uh, were able to do that and spend this day with us, at least three hours with us. So what I'd like to do next is go on to our next topic, which is going to be creating calculated fields. Uh, two different types of calculations we can do. And I have a lot of slides on this, but I'm going to focusing on just this one slide for the discussion here before we move into the, our examples. Um, <laughs> so I glanced over and saw uh, Garrett asking for 20% off on a flight from Denmark. Garrett, I'm a, I apologize. Unfortunately, I can't do that. But uh, I, nice try anyways. Uh, so what we're going to do next is talk about how we can build new calculated fields on top of the model that we've defined so far. And what's the whole idea behind creating this calculated fields? is it allows us to be able to have additional fields or a different additional metrics that we can use whenever we get to our reporting section. Okay, so once we're ready to build our reports, we'll want to have things like time intelligence formulas, like compare this year to last year's sales. We'll want to be able to compare year-to-date sales, for example. And all those are measures and metrics that we'll want to have included. There's two different types of calculations, and really for, for that matter, there's a third one that they've added uh, in the last couple months where you can have calculated columns, calculated measures, and then the one I don't have listed here is called calculated tables. You can actually have a calculated table based off of another table. You could even build a calendar table uh, if you wanted to as well. There's some calendar functions to build a calendar table for you or a date table if you don't have one already. So there's some neat things you can do there. Check out my blog. I've written on that in the past. So what we're going to talk about, though, is calculated columns and calculated measures. That'll be our focal area, focal point. Uh, starting with calculated columns, which are going to generally, not always, but generally store more descriptive data, more descriptive information. So things that describe a sale, describe a time card entry, describe um, uh, an offense if you're looking at law enforcement data, things like that. So those are more descriptive data in general. You can, of course, have metrics that are calculated columns, but generally speaking, you're doing more descriptive data. Calculated measures, generally, are more metric information, so metrics that you're trying to analyze and aggregate data, roll data up, look at things by uh, time intelligence, for example, or sum, or min, or max, all those typical aggregates are generally going to be done as measures. There's exceptions to all rules, of course, but for this, this point, generally think of measures as metric data you're trying to analyze. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at how you can build out some calculated columns and calculated measures in the model that we've designed so far. Okay? So what I'd like to do is take you through the steps of how I can create calculated measures. Well, let's, let's, me, let's start with calculated columns first. There's actually multiple places where you can create calculated columns. You can do it from the report view that you're looking at right now. You can also do it through the data view that you see on the left-hand side. And because we haven't really spent a whole lot of time in the data view on the left-hand side, let's go ahead and work our way over the, the data view just so you can see what's, what it's like there and, and we can talk through how you can create calculated columns there. So I'm going to select the data view, and you'll see literally it shows you the data. Okay, So it's showing me the data and all the tables that I've imported. You can also see on the right-hand side it has all of the tables that I've imported. So I can flip between the date table, the customer table, the sales table, product, and sales territory. Okay, So I can see all of them here. And if I want to create a new field, say for example, customer table, I would select the table here. And let's say for example that I want to combine the first and last name of my customer. So I see first and last name are columns that I have inside of my data model. And so I'd like to combine those two into a single field because I'm tired of dragging first and last name into my reports. I just want to see one field that shows the customer name. 
And so if I want to do something like that, I can create a calculated column by going up to the modeling ribbon up in the very top. Okay, so again, you have to have the customer table selected, and then you're going to go up to the top ribbon here where you see the modeling ribbon. And underneath the modeling ribbon, there's three buttons here underneath the calculation section, new measure, new column, new table. Remember I told you there's a new thing here called calculated tables. You can also build a new table off of another table, for example. It's like a filter table. Um, in this case, though, I want to create a new column. So I'll select new column here. And it's going to show me in the formula bar. By the way, this formula bar works very similar to how Excel formulas do. So if you're familiar with Excel formulas, you're now using a query language called DAX which is very, very similar to Excel formulas. So if you consider yourself familiar with Excel formulas, then you'll, be, you'll, you'll pick up DAX very quickly. DAX is, uh, stands for the Data Analysis Expression Language, by the way. All right, so what I'd like to do in this example is I want to read, first of all, let's not call this column. Column is a pretty terrible name for this. So let's call this name, okay? And I'm going to zoom in on this so you can see it a little better. So I'm creating a new uh, calculated column called name, and then on the other side of the equal sign, I'm going to define what makes up the name column. Now if you've played around with DAX for a little bit, you may notice that I'm going to do a few things here at least to start off with that are extra work that you don't have to do. I'm going to show you some of the cheats that you can do after I show you the hard way first. I, I want you to appreciate those little cheat codes I give you here in a few moments. So I mentioned that DAX is very similar to Excel formulas. Uh, the, one of the more significant differences between DAX and Excel formulas is you're not really doing cell references here, you're doing column references. So you're not going to reference cell A3, you're going to re reference column first name or column last name. Okay? So if I wanted to bring both first and last name together, I could do that by first defining the first column. My first, my first column in this case, case obviously will be the first name column. Now, when you're writing DAX, the way that you can get started is by starting, starting by identifying the, the table name first. And again, if you've written DAX before, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm making you do a little extra work first, and then I'll show you the cheat codes later. So the table name in my case is going to be surrounded by a single quote. So you'll do a single quote, and you'll notice you get this IntelliSense window pops up. And this IntelliSense window actually helps you write the code. You can you know, literally type it if you want. Yeah, so I can type customer if I wanted to. That's my table I'm working in right now. Or I can use the IntelliSense here and kind of use the up and down arrows to be able to return back results. All right, so if I go down here, for example, and I want to return back the first name column, I can go down to where you see first name and hit tab next to it. And if I hit tab, it will return back the first name. So right now, if I want to see the result of that first name column, that first name value placed in this new column, I can hit enter. And when you hit enter, you'll see that it's going to run the results, and I will actually see that data brought back in a new column here called name. Okay, so just some of the basics. We're getting the basics first, and we'll get a little bit more complicated as we go. All right, now if you want to change this new column that you just created, you just go back up to the formula bar, and you can make new changes to it, or you can append things to it if you wanted to. So for example, if I wanted to, I could concatenate the last name to the first name. Now the concatenate symbol here is the same as it is in Excel. You can use the ampersand symbol. There's also a concatenate function that is an optional uh, uh, formula you could use as well. I'm going to use the ampersand here to be able to concatenate, and I'm going to add in an empty space between first and last name, because I don't want first and last name smushed together. I want first name, space, last name. So I'm going to concatenate first name with a space that's double quotes here. That's a double quote and a space and a double quote. And then I'm going to concatenate in the last name. Okay. Now, there's a couple ways that you can write DAX. I told you the harder way first. The easier way to write DAX is you can actually click on the column names that you see below. Okay. So check this out. Rather than me actually typing out all that code, I can scroll over, find the last name column, which is right here, and check this out. Instead of typing it, this time I'm actually going to click on it, and it writes the formula for me. Okay? Notice one difference about it here is you'll notice that it doesn't put the single quotes around it. Those single quotes are optional. The, the, really time, the, the time they're only really mandatory that you put the single quotes around the table name is whenever you have a space in the table name. So uh, we have a table name right now called Internet Space Sales, Internet Sales. I would have to put single quotes around that table name to be able to identify it here. All right, so I've got the first and last name concatenated together. If I hit enter, it'll return back those results. And if I go to the very end, I should see this new column created here called name. And you'll see, indeed, it does have my first and last name concatenated together. Okay? 
That is an example of a calculated column. Now in the normal class that we teach, we have a lot more time to talk about calculated columns. For this purpose, I just want to show you at least one so you have an idea of how calculated columns are done. Now the other examples that I want to show you when it comes to DAX are around calculated measures. Okay, so again, the difference between calculated columns and calculated measures. Calculated columns are generally speaking more descriptive fields, like you've seen here. This is the name that describes a sale of some kind. Um, calculated columns, another thing to be aware of with calculated columns is they do take up extra storage space inside of your model. So you can see there is actually a value stored in here for everything that rep is represented by that formula. So extra storage space is taken up by me creating that calculated column. Now the difference between calculated, calculated columns and calculated measures is calculated measures do not take up any extra storage space than literally the amount of storage space it takes to store the formula itself. Calculated measures do not store the value for every cross-section of the data that you have. It simply stores the formula, and then that formula, that formula is calculated on the fly whenever it's dragged into the report. Now, don't, make that, don't let that fool you. It is actually very fast. There's not a, whole, a big delay when you do calculated measures. Uh, it just depends on how complicated the measure is itself. All right, so if I want to create calculated measures now, I would go to the table that I want to define my measures on. Okay. Now, you'll see, if I, if I look over on the right-hand side, I have five different tables that we've now imported. Uh, you can choose which one of these you want to put your measures on, your metrics. Um, one that would probably make most sense is the one here called Internet Sales. That Internet Sales table is the one that would store all my metrics information in it. And generally speaking, you like to consolidate all those metrics into a single table. So I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to select the Internet Sales table here. Okay, and when I select the internet sales table, you can see the data view in the background now shows that specific table that we're looking at here. And if I want to create a new measure, not a column, but a new measure on top of that table, I can go up to the, the uh, excuse me, not the formula bar, go up to the ribbon again on the top, find the modeling ribbon, and select new measure here. Okay, so I'll select new measure. All right. And you can see, again, it does use the formula bar for this, but it's a measure, not a column. It's a little bit different. And so what I can do is I can start to define measurement data that I want. So to give you an example here, maybe I want to bring back a total sales measure. And so I could type something like, uh, let's call this a total sales measure. And let's define this and call this something like the sum of my uh, sales amount. I have a sales amount column in here, so I'll refer to this as sales amount. So I'm taking the sum of the sales amounts. Now you'll notice here this time I'm not referring to the table name. The table name is actually optional as long as you're writing the formula against the table you're already in. So right now I'm about to place this total measure inside the internet sales table. If I tried to place total sales into a different table, then I would have to put the table name here. But in this case, because it's already inside of the internet sales table, it's an understood or an implicit understanding of what the table is. All right, so I'm going to call that total sales. I'll hit enter. It's just a simple sum of the sales amount. And then the other thing you'd likely want to do is make sure you apply formatting to this. So right now it has a currency general formatting. I'm probably going to want to change that currency general because I think it has many more decimal places than I care to keep. So I'm going to change this formatting to a currency, and I'm going to make it a U.S. dollar. All right, good deal. Let's do another one. So I'm going to create another measure. This one's also going to be fairly simple. This one I'm going to call total cost. And basically what I'm doing is I'm building up to a more complicated one here in a few moments. But this one is going to be total cost, where again, I'm going to take the sum of the total product cost here. You'll notice the IntelliSense makes it very easy to write some of this code a lot faster than you might normally be able to do so. And I'm going to go ahead and format this one as a currency as well. Okay, so I see total cost stored here as a US dollar currency. I'll hit enter on that, and it's now stored that formula. So what I'm building up to is I can now take these individual formulas that I've created, and I can combine them, or I can use them with each other. So let me show you an example. Let's create another one. I'll do another new measure. This time, I'll call this one profit. And what I can do, keep in mind, the first two we did were fairly simple. We did the sum of the sales amount, and we did the sum of the total product cost. But now I want to take the difference between those two and determine what my profit is. So what I can do is I can say, well, let's take the total sales measure, subtract it from the total cost, and that should give me a rough estimate on what my profit is for, for this example. I can also do some other, other types of measures if I wanted to. Let's, uh, for, first of all, let me make sure, make sure I format that, format that as a currency. But I can also do some other types of measures if I want. Let's say I create another new measure here. 
And this time, let's call this one something like profit margin. So I'll call, you, see, you can see, you can actually go through this pretty quickly and create quite a few once you get the hang of it. And I'll call this one profit margin, where I could do, I could do this one a couple of different ways. I could say that I want to take the uh, profit and divide it by total sales, and you could do it that way if you wanted to. Or you could use another formula that's available in here called a divide function. So there's two ways you can do division here inside of Power BI. You can use the traditional divide symbol that you see here, or you could use a divide function and check out what the divide function does. If I use the divide function, you'll notice here in the description that it tells you it handles division by zero errors. So if you're you know, kind of wary of division by zero happening in your formulas, use the divide function instead. In fact, I kind of get in the habit of using divide no matter what. And then all you have to do is provide the numerator and the denominator, and it does the rest for you. So it's a very easy to function, easy function to use, and it makes it so that you can easily handle traditional scenarios like division by zero. All right, so I'm going to use make this profit margin. I'll also format this as a percentage. Profit margin will be a percentage here, and hit enter on that formula to make sure it stores it here. All right, so we've got a couple formulas. We've got we pulled together a few things in here. We could we could go a little step further, and we could start to create some time intelligence formulas if I wanted to, just to give you a quick sampling of what a time intelligence formula might look like. Let's create one new one here. I'm going to do this one a little faster because I want to get towards the visualizations towards the end here. Let's say, for example, I wanted to create a function that did year to date. I could say I want a year to date profit calculation, and I could use there's a function in here called total YTD you see right here. There's also a total QTD and a total MTD. And if I do something like total YTD, I can tell it that I want to calculate out profit, but I want to make sure that it does it year to date. So you'll see here it's referring to a dates expression. The dates expression is actually looking for the date column in your date table. So I would have to tell it from my date table which one of the columns is a date column. And in my case, it's a column called full date alternate key. That's the column inside my date table that has a date data type. Okay? And what I can do if I select that, I'll go ahead and uh, enter on that total YTD formula. Probably want to make sure that I do the formatting here as well. Make sure that it's formatting as a currency like we've done the last couple times. And that will now give me some year to date time intelligence functionality. There are many, many, many other types of functions that you can use that give you time intelligence capability. But for the time that we have today, I wanted to give you a little taste of what it looks like. All right. Good deal. So we've talked quite a bit here now about creating the model. I want to transition now into actually visualizing the data because we have about 40 minutes left. And I want to make sure we have time for that and also publishing this to the Power BI service. So our next step then that we're going to talk about is actually creating reports off of what we've done so far. To create reports, you're going to go up to the report view that we have inside the Power BI desktop application. That's where all the report creation is done. Okay, so I'm going to go over to the report view. And tell you what, I'm going to delete some of these things I plugged in here earlier just to give you some examples. We're going to start from scratch. Now the neat thing about how the report view works is you have included with Power BI a slew of different visualizations that are available to you. You see that in the visualization pane right here. But if there's a visualization that you would like to use that you do not have inside of this visualization pane, there are several, I think there's about 45, almost 50 now, custom visualizations that you can download for free. And this is all provided to you by Microsoft. If you go to the website, visuals, .powerbi.com. And if you go to visuals.powerbi.com, you'll find about 45 or 50 custom visuals that have been published out by uh, vendors. Some of them are Microsoft and some of them are not Microsoft, but you can go download them and make them visualizations inside of your report. So if I go to visuals.powerbi.com, you can see all the different custom visuals that you can download and make part of your solution. They are absolutely free to download. Note, you should note that a lot of these are done by other third-party vendors, so you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, some of them are higher quality than others. Uh, there is a review process that Microsoft does on it, but you know, you always maybe want to be kind of wary of things like that. So let me give you a quick example of how you can import a custom visual. If there's a visual from here that I want to use, uh, I can click on it, download it, okay, and once it's downloaded, I've already downloaded all of them. I can now come over to the report view, and you'll see there's this little ellipsis right here. And that's where you can add in custom visuals that are not already built into the interface. 
So all the ones above that are ones that are built into the interface. But if I want to import a custom one, I would go download it from visuals.powerbi.com, click on the little ellipses button here. It's going to give me a little warning, say, hey, you're kind of trusting someone else that's not Microsoft. So it does give you a little warning here to be wary. Okay. I can then select import if I am willing to trust it. And there is some code review of it, so you know you, you do have some level of trust of it. Microsoft does review it. And then I can go find where I downloaded the custom visuals. So I have a bunch of them I've already downloaded here, and I can choose one. I'm not really going to be too picky on which one I choose here. I'm just going to pick, uh, uh, let's click this map. So I can select this map, this custom map, and it's now imported it into my interface. You can see there's a new visual that now appears here, and I can now use it just like any of the other native visualizations that were in there previously. So I can select that visual and then start to add data to it, just like any of the ones that are built into the product. Okay, so there's a lot of neat things that you, what you probably want to take a look at this custom visuals. We're actually right now in the process of talking about creating a custom visuals class. So that way you can learn how to use each of those custom visuals in depth. So very interesting stuff that you can do there. All right, so let's show you actually how to build out some of these reports and I'll walk you through those steps. So you'll notice on the right-hand side you have a field list that has all the tables and columns that you've created thus far. And you'll also see right above that there's a search bar to help you find the data you care about faster. This is going to be really, really helpful to use this search bar because you have a lot of columns in here and it can be a little difficult to find what you need if you have to scroll through and, and search through every one of the tables. So I use this search bar pretty heavily. If you want to use the search bar, you come up to the search bar, type in whatever it is you're looking for. So if I'm looking for profit margin, for example, I can type profit or profit margin and it returns back what I'm searching for. It makes it way easier to find the field you need. I would check off or you can even drag in profit margin if you want. You can drag it in or just check it off and it brings it into my report design surface. So you can see it over here as a column chart right now. If I want to add something to it, I can go search for another field. So maybe I want to bring in, for example, I want to bring in and look at the uh, profit margin by country. So I can search country and you'll notice here that it brings back the sales territory country. I could either drag that in or you can check it off again and it adds it as a visual here on top of my report. Okay, So I can see here, and of course you can make this larger if you wanted to, you can see here that profit margin is, when, when you look at it in a bar chart, it doesn't vary a whole lot. It's, it's pretty static here because it's a percentage. And a percentage here is roughly around 41%. It doesn't deviate a whole lot. This one's 40.68%. This one's 41%. They don't deviate a whole lot. But you can choose different visuals that show variance much easier. So for example, if I, if I have the chart selected, I could change this to something like a line chart, and you'll see that it'll show variance a lot easier in, inside of a line chart here. So just depending on which type of visual you choose, you might be able to get a better visual of the different variances of data that you have. You might also choose something like an area chart. So you'll see there's an area chart you can choose from here as well, and you can maybe want to compare multiple countries. So I could bring in countries as a legend or, or anything really, and I can be able to visualize this in multiple ways uh, as we start to, start to talk about the different visuals that are available here. Here's what I'd like to do, though. I want to actually see profit margin by time. Right now we're looking at it by country. Let's look at it by something like, uh, let's say, the months. So I can type in the months on the top here, and I could check off the English month name. Remember, this is the column that we, affect, we modified the sort order for. And I can see each of the different countries and really this kind of uh, odd looking visual here where it's showing me every one of the countries and all of the uh, profit margins. Now, based on the way that you actually store this inside the report, you're going to see it in different ways. Right now, I'm seeing a, a line for each month when really in reality, I'd probably like to see a line for each country. So you can come over to the field list area right here, and you can flip-flop some of these things around. So for example, if I wanted to see months going across the bottom instead of countries going across the bottom, I would likely want to take out the month for a moment and drag country down to the legend section. You'll notice right now it doesn't really show you a lot, so I need to add month back into this. So I can check month back off or bring it back into the report, and it'll add it to the legend section where we can see a little bit better of a visual here of what the data looks like. This one also might be better represented as an area chart. So if I select area, you'll see it allows me to see a, a good comparison between each of the countries by month. All right, so kind of interesting here, a nice way to be able to look at the data. Let's, uh, let's take this another route. Let's say that we also want to be able to visualize this and look at something like a different metric. Maybe we want to look at total sales. So I'm going to go over here to a new area. Anytime you want to create a new visual, 
you want to click somewhere in the background or the white area of the report. As long as you have this visual selected, it assumes that you're trying to modify that visual. But as soon as you click somewhere in the background, it thinks you're trying to create a new one. And in this case, we do want to create a new one. So I'll click somewhere in the background and then go back over to my field list to determine what else I want to bring in. So in this example, what I'd like to bring in is something, let's say, from my product table. And so if I wanted to, I can go into my product table and search for columns, or I can actually search by going up to the search bar. We showed you that earlier. And I could do, maybe say for example, I wanted to uh, bring in and analyze uh, all of my products by um, their class. So all of my products are, are focused in on some kind of a class. I have three classes here. You can see it brought it in as a table when I selected it initially. You can, of course, increase the text size of that if you want to be able to read it. So I have a blank class, an H class, an L class, and an M class, and that's, I'm sure that's something meaningful to my business. But I want to see what my sales compare like for each of the classes that I have. So I can again search and search for total sales and bring in the total sales measure here, and I can see it and there's a table right now, and I can analyze it as a table, or I can convert it to a different type of visual. If I want to see it as something like a column chart, I can make a column chart out of it and make that a little larger if I wanted to. And now I have two different visuals here that I'm able to analyze at the same time. Now one of the neat things about how the visuals work here is they're all interactive by default. Assuming you defined relationships inside the relationship view, remember we, we, we defined relationships in our relationship view before? We created a relationship between the sales table and the date table. Assuming you define those relationships, then any interaction that you do between the reports, meaning anytime I click on an item here, you'll notice it also filters down my other report. So if I click on the end product class, you'll notice how it shows the profit margin for that product class inside each of the countries. So it's very interactive. You can multi-select. I can select more than one class here if I wanted to and see how it compares based on the selection that I make. That's just how Power BI natively works. As long as there's relationships between your data, you can select one field and it'll filter another field automatically. There are ways that you can actually turn off that filtering. So Say, for example, I didn't want to filter the, the visual on the right-hand side based on the, what I select on the left-hand side. There is a way that you can turn off that filtering, and you'll find it underneath the uh, format part of the ribbon here. So you'll see here there's a format section, and underneath the format section, there's a button on the left-hand side called Edit Interactions. And that Edit Interactions button allows you to tell Power BI that I do or I don't want to filter based on me clicking on certain things. So a quick little example of that is if I click on uh, this chart and then select Edit Interactions, I can tell it that I don't want to filter this chart. So you'll see the little circle with the, X through, with the slash through it. That now means anytime I click on something here, it actually doesn't filter the other chart. You can also change it if you wanted to. You could make it filter it. Or what you can do is if you can, you, you can select different visuals, and based on the different visuals, you have different ways you can filter things. So a column chart, for example, has a couple different ways you can filter it has a type of filter called a highlight. It also has a more traditional filter, or it has you can turn off filters altogether. So what that tells you is if I select a line over here, if I click a line, the default filter is that it'll actually highlight the portion of the column chart that it's filtering. That's the default for column charts is to highlight. That's what this guy is right here, is it's going to highlight a portion of the column to filter by. You can also make it where it actually just generally filters the whole thing. So if you select filter, anytime I select a line over here, it's going to filter the entire chart. But again, then this is kind of a nice option where you can actually highlight a portion of the chart based on the selection you make in another visual. Okay? All right, so that's some of the filtering you can do inside the visualization side. Uh, now, if you have things, I see, I see a quick question about drill through. If you have things like hierarchies, you can drill deeper and deeper into the data. And there's even some capabilities that are new that just came out last week where you can control the drill through and you can actually see the data that you're drilling into here. You'll see up here in the visual tool section, there's a drill menu where I can see the data. So I'm able to see the physical data that's also in the chart. You can turn that on or turn that off over here in the top left. And that allows me to see the data. You can also drill into the data. So you'll see there's this option here called see records. If I had a hierarchy of data, then I could drill deeper and deeper into the data. Very nice interaction that you have built into the tool. All right. Great. So we're getting we're in the last 30 minutes here. We're coming on the home stretch. I want to show you a few other visualizations before we start to actually publish this off. So let's actually go and create another report or another page of a report. So far right now we have one page that we've created. You can create multiple pages 
by going down to the bottom section here, you'll see that you have page one already created. Of course, you would want to rename that. And then if you want to create another page, you hit the little plus sign, and that will add a new page to this report for you. So I'll hit the plus sign, and it gives me a new blank design surface. It's kind of like spreadsheets, right? It looks like Excel where you can go between multiple spreadsheets you have. And what I'd like to do in this one is I want to create some new types of visuals. So say, for example, what I'd like to do is I want to see a comparison between my uh, total sales, my total cost, okay, let's bring in cost, and let's also look at profit. So I want to compare three different metrics that I have here. And initially, it's going to bring it in here as a column chart by default. But what I'd like to do is I want to do a comparison in a more unique type of way with a scatter chart. A scatter chart is one of the more interesting types of visuals that are natively built into Power BI. You'll, see, you'll find the scatter chart. Again, you can, you can change the visual by making sure you have it selected. And then you can find the scatter chart by looking inside the visualizations pane, and you'll find it right here. It's the one that looks like a bubble chart here. And if I select that, it'll take this column chart, convert it into a scatter chart for me, which looks like initially here just a single bubble. I'm going to make this take up the entirety of the screen for a moment, and then let's talk about how we can make this a little bit more advanced. If I wanted to, I could take this little bubble chart that we have, and I can enhance it by adding different slices to the data. Say, for example, I wanted to look at a bubble for each country. I can, let me bring that back in. I can search for country here. All right, and I can select the country field, and I can make this into the legend where I can see multiple bubbles and the different colors for each of the bubbles that I have if I wanted to. And the neat thing about how the scatter chart works is you also have the capability to animate it. If I wanted to take data and actually animate it across time or across a numerical value or even across text values that I have, I can add a play access to the scatter chart. Scatter chart's pretty neat in that it actually allows you, like I said, to animate the data across time. So for example, if I were to search here for, instead of searching for country, let me bring in the year. I can bring in the year here and add the calendar year into a special axis that, that you have here called a play axis right here. If I add the, uh, not yearly income, excuse me, if I add calendar year into the play axis, that way it would actually allow me to see the data across time. So let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to drag calendar year into the play axis. You'll notice in the top right it says 2008, so we're looking at 2008 data. That's the last year worth of data I have in this data set. And you'll notice also in the bottom left that there's now a new play button that you can use. That is freshly added in here. That is a new play access that we just added a moment ago. And if I select the play button, it'll actually show me my data moving across time. Now, I only have four years' worth of data here, but obviously if I had more years' worth of data, it would flow very nicely. I could analyze all this data across time. You can also select a bubble. So if I selected Australia here, for example, it would show me the path at how it got to where it's at now. So it's actually showing me a line and, and guiding me through how it got to where it's at right now. Or I can select a different one here. Say so I selected Germany. It shows me the path of how Germany got to where it's at now. You can even compare multiple bubbles. If I hold down control and select the United States, I can compare both of those bubbles, and I can hit the play button again and see across time how they compare to each other. Scatter chart's a really, really cool chart. It allows you to create a lot of neat visualizations in here. Uh, very, very functional, and it is, they're normally improving on each of these visuals. So there's a lot of nice other visuals we can make here. Uh, with the last bit of time we have left, what I'd like to do is focus in on uh, the service. And I, I encourage you guys to go play with the visuals. Like I said, there are 40 to 45, to almost 50 different custom visuals you can use. There's already a bunch of them in here by default. Uh, that you can play around with as well. So I encourage you, there's about 24, 23 or so that are built in the tool you can use. And uh, just play with them, interact with them, enjoy them. There's a lot of fun things you can build on inside the reporting environment here. So with the last bit of time that we have here, I want to show you what do I do with this next? How do I take this and publish it so others can interact with it? I really want to share this with others. I built a report. I love the interaction that I have here where I can select a column chart and see the area chart modified. I love that I can do that. How do I share this with other people? And that's the last piece that we're going to show you here is how do I share this? To share this report with others, you can publish it to the Power BI service. This is the current way that they have available, that Microsoft has available for sharing results. Now, 
the Power BI service is a cloud service, and I know I saw at some point a question in here about how do I share this uh, with a, in an on-premises method. And uh, the good news is Microsoft is working on an on-premises method of sharing your results. And the, the likely method, the method that it's going to be done through is reporting services. So if you're using SQL Server in the future, in the future, reporting services in SQL Server will actually allow you to publish Power BI reports to it. And that way you don't have to use the cloud service. If you don't want, you can actually use the SQL Server service, the, the, the report server. Now here's the problem with that. Now you, you, might, you might already envision the problem with this, but the, the problem is Power BI is in constant change. You're always adding new features and functions to it. And you're losing a little bit of the benefit of, of the agile approach to Power BI when you use the on-premises version. That's, that's not even released yet, but when it comes out, you'll be losing a little bit of that benefit of having the capability of, uh, of constantly getting the updates that Power BI releases. So you've got to be careful with that. You've got to be careful and make sure that you're, you're making that decision because you absolutely have to. If you absolutely have to and you're not allowed to use cloud for whatever reason in your environment, then yes, that's a, that's a genuine reason for using the on-premises version. But again, it's not out yet. It's to come soon. And the method of delivery of that will be through reporting services. Um, but if you want to stay the most up-to-date and have all the most flexible features, the Cloud Power BI service, which is the only way to do this right now, is, is the best way to go. And, and honestly, I'm, I, it really is the best way to go. You're, you're seeing new features added to it on a regular basis. I really recommend focusing in on the cloud area if you, if you can. If, um, if data going into the cloud is an issue for you, and for some organizations it is, I will point out to you a couple things. First of all, uh, Power BI has just recently met uh, HIPAA compliance and a few other regulatory compliances recently. So you make sure you check out the Microsoft Trust Center for Power BI so you can understand exactly what that means, more, more than what we have time to describe right now. Um, and you should also know that there are methods of publishing the visuals and a connection to the live on-premises data as well. So you don't necessarily have to put your data into the cloud to be able to use the Power BI service. The cloud service does not mean your data has to go into the cloud. That is the default behavior, but it's not the mandatory way of doing things. Now for the example I'm going to show you today, I am going to push this data into the cloud. That is the default behavior. Um, if I don't want to do, do you, to use that default behavior, that would be that whole idea of direct query that I mentioned before, where direct query allows me to connect directly to a live data source that I have on premise and be able to kind of easily serve that data up as a visual in the Power BI. Great. Now, with that little bit of preface there, or, or, or just discussion before we go into actually publishing, to publish this into the Power BI service, I'm going to go up to the ribbon on the very top and find the home ribbon. Okay. And I see there's a ton of questions. I want to make sure I have some time for that at the end and answer as many of those as possible. So I'm going to try and uh, uh, get pretty close here to ending with, with at least five to ten minutes left so I can answer some questions for you guys. And again, like I said, if there's some questions that you guys have that you want to ask, go ahead and plug it in the chat window, and I'll try and answer as many of those as I can when, in, in my blog. And I'll follow up via my blog if you'd like. Okay? All right, cool. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take what we've developed so far. Again, not a very big report, but I like it so far. I want to get it and share it with others. And to do that, I'm going to come up to where you see the Publish button on the very top. On the very top, you'll see there's a Publish button here where I can now publish this to the Power BI service. So I'll select Publish. And it's going to ask me, first of all, hey, you need to save this. So I need to save a local copy of this somewhere first. Let me go ahead and save that for the purposes of this class. Okay, so I'll just give it some kind of name. We'll call this our uh, Power BI Takeover. Okay. And I don't know. I actually wanted to call it Power BI Takeover. Let's try that again. All right, and I'll hit save. Ah, let's try that again. There we go. All right, there we go. I'll hit save. It's now saved that, and it's going to help me and step me through the process of deploying this to the Power BI service. So you'll notice here that it says I can publish this to different workspaces. A workspace is like a collaborative environment inside of Power BI. So if I want to be able to share this with others, I would publish this to a workspace that has other users that are part of it. Okay, And I'll show you how you can create workspaces in, in, in a little bit. But for the time being, I'm going to publish this to my personal workspace. It's the one here called My Workspace, and I am the only one that's able to actually view anything in My Workspace. Uh, but I, can, I could, of course, deploy this to one of the other workspaces that others have access to, and they can collaborate with me. I'm going to publish this to my, my personal repository, and I'll hit Publish. It's now going to publish my Power BI Takeover uh, 
PBIX file to the Power BI service. And once it's done, I'll be able to actually see it from a website, from, a, from the cloud service. You can see it's done here now. And we're going to talk about a few of these things like quick insights here in a moment, but I can go ahead and open that inside the Power BI uh, uh, com. Uh, before, let me go ahead and click on that, and as I'm loading that, one of the other things I'd like to describe to you that's fairly new inside the Power BI desktop is there's also this new concept, and when I say new, I, need, I mean new as of last week, of being able to create Power BI templates. And you'll see templates, if you go up to the file menu in the top left, I can select file, and you'll see there's now an export option where you can export a template, and that template's going to have basically everything that you've developed here, and you can hand it off to another user, it, ha it has everything in it except for the data. Okay, So it has the query, it has um, the structure of the data model, it has the visualizations. It's just going to prompt the user to sign in using their credentials whenever they go uh, to use the template. So that's a new feature that's been added. And basically it allows you to take what you've done in the desktop tool and hand it off to somebody else and they would use their credentials to see and enhance what you've already done. All right, so I published this now to the Power BI desktop, and, uh, sorry, to the Power BI service. And I'm seeing that here already in the Power BI service. And, and by, by the way, the way you get here is you just go to PowerBI.com. If I go to PowerBI.com and sign in, and by the way, this is where you can download the Power BI desktop for free. But if I go to PowerBI.com and sign in, it's going to take me to my visuals. Here's one that I've done in the past. And if I want to see the new one that we just deployed, I can open up the menu on the left-hand side over here. Okay, you'll see the three lines. That, that's where you expand it. So I'll expand this, and I'll see all of these reports that I've created in the past. Some of them are, are actually internal reports. It tells you uh, I actually use this for internal purposes at Pragmatic Works. And then I also have several in here that we have for class purposes, including the one that we just deployed a few moments ago, the one here called Power BI Takeover. So you'll see, let me zoom in a little bit, you'll see the one here called Power BI Takeover is the one that we just deployed a few moments ago. And if I want, I can go look at the reports that we deployed. So I'll select the Power BI Takeover report. And you can see, just like we saw from the desktop tool, I'm now looking at the reports that we saw in the desktop are now visible from a web browser. Okay, so from the web browser, I'm able to see the same things. I'm also able to interact with them from a web browser, just like we could before, all from a web browser. Even the animation piece that I showed you guys before, all of it works, noticing here from a web browser. Okay, you can even add on new reports if you wanted to. So new pages to the report, you can see here where you can click Edit Report. I can edit this report and start to add on new pages if I wanted to, and you can even add in new visualizations here. Very similar, if not exactly the same as we did from the desktop application. So that's already built into the web browser. Very cool functionality where you can edit reports or create reports both from the web browser or from the desktop tool. All right, so I don't necessarily want to add any new reports here, but what I would like to show you guys how you can do is create dashboards. So this is one point of terminology that's important to understand from a Power BI perspective. You have three objects in the Power BI service that you deploy. You have data sets. Okay, so data sets, think of that as like the query and the model. Okay, and you can see that we have our Power BI takeover data set right here. Again, that includes the query during, that we got during the data discovery phase. It also includes the data model. You then have reports which is what we're looking at right now on the right-hand side of my screen. That's a report. Uh, we have multiple pages inside of a report. And then finally, you also can create dashboards. All right, so what's the difference between a report and a dashboard? Now, reports are what we've created previously. Reports can have multiple visualizations that are part of them. You have pages in a report. They look like this. This is what we created earlier. And you can select them. You can filter them. You can interact with them. Dashboards are a little bit different. The way dashboards work in Power BI is you can take a snapshot of any one of your visuals. So say, for example, this area chart that I have here. I really like this area chart, and I'd like to add it to a dashboard. You can add it to a dashboard by selecting this little pin icon right here, and that will pin it to a dashboard. The idea here with pinning it to a dashboard is it takes this one visual, not all of them, it takes this one visual from this report and pins it to a dashboard, so it's a visual that you want to focus in on when you're looking at a dashboard. So imagine, picture this, you have uh, a bunch of reports that you've created, and, and one of the pages on your reports has five or six different visuals. Well, you don't necessarily want all six of those visuals to appear on the dashboard. You just want the ones that you're most concerned with. So you can pin one or two of those visuals to the dashboard, and that way you see those visuals 
whenever the dashboard is opened. And if you want to see all five or six of those visuals, you can actually click on it from the dashboard and it will launch the report. It drills through to the report that you designed. Let me show you what I mean by this. I've described it. Let me show you how this actually works. If I want to pin this visual, I'll click on the little pin icon next to the visual. It will prompt me to either create a new report or pin this to an existing report. I'm actually going to pin this to a new dashboard. Excuse me, I said report, I meant dashboard. I'm going to pin this to a new dashboard, and I'll call this one my Power BI Takeover. Okay, and I'm creating a brand new dashboard for this, and I'll hit pin. And now, if I scroll up, you'll see here there is a new dashboard that's been created. It has a little star symbol next to it indicating that it's new. And if I select that Power BI Takeover dashboard, I can see it here. I can, I can see that it is functional. If I click on this, it'll actually take me to the report that we looked at earlier. So when you click on an item from the dashboard, it drills to the other report. You can also resize the tiles. These are called tiles. You can resize the tiles however you'd like to see them. Okay, you can make them as small as you want or as large as you want. Okay, And you can interact with them here by clicking on them, and it takes you to the larger version of the dashboard. So if I click on this, it takes me to the dashboard. The other thing that you can do as well is you can pin an entire page of a report. So if you did have five or six visuals that you wanted to pin to the dashboard, you can do that as well. And that's done by clicking this pin live page button up at the top. So if I select pin live page, it's going to take the entire page of the report that I have and pin that to the dashboard as well. And it prompts me and says, do you want to pin this to a new dashboard or to an existing dashboard? And I can tell it that I want to do it to an existing dashboard. So I'll pin that. Now when I go look at my dashboard, you'll see there's two visuals here. One, the area chart that we had earlier, and then one, the live version of the page of the report we looked at earlier. So let me describe the diff diff difference between these two. The one on the top where I pin the visual, this pins a snapshot view of that report visual. This is not necessarily an uh, immediate up-to-date version of the data. It's a, it's, a, it's a snapshot version of it. You click on it. It does get updated regularly, so don't worry. It does get updated but it's a snapshot. The version that I have on the bottom here is actually a live version of the report, meaning that any interaction that I have, I can click on things. It doesn't take me to the report when I click on things. It actually allows me to filter and interact with the data from the dashboard. You can also hit the play button, just like you saw earlier, and it allows you to interact with it. You can resize this as well. I realize it's very large on my screen. I can come over here and resize this as something more appropriate if I wanted to and visualize it a little bit differently. So the live view of the dashboard or the live tile allows you to see a live version of the report where you can still interact with it, whereas the regular pin visual is basically like a snapshot version of the data. Okay? So kind of the difference between the two there. Now the snapshot, don't get me wrong, the snapshot does get updated frequently. It's not like it's completely static, but it is a snapshot. All right, the other piece of this that I'd like to show you, in, in, in addition to pinning items on a dashboard, is how do I now share this with other people? So if I really like what I've created and I want to share it with others, I have a couple options as far as how I can share it with other people. One way is up actually in the top right of my screen where you'll see there's a button here called Share. And if I click on Share, it'll prompt me to provide the logins for or the email addresses for the people that I want to share this dashboard with. And so that way they have basically like read access to the dashboard. So let me show you what that looks like. If I hit the share button here, it'll prompt me to provide email addresses of people that I want to share with. So say, for example, Liz, who is also on the call, I can share with Liz. And I can share this dashboard. And you'll note on the bottom, it also by default allows her to share it with other people. That's the default behavior. You don't have to do that. If you don't want Liz to be able to share it with others, I can uncheck that. If I had it selected by default and she started sharing with other people and then I realized I wanted to revoke that access, you can do that as well. And you can go revoke the access of everyone she shared with. But the default behavior is, yes, I can share with Liz and then she can in turn and share with others if she wants to. That's the default behavior. And that gives her basically like read access to this dashboard. Okay, that's one way of sharing. The other way of sharing is more of a collaborative development environment, which is called workspaces. Right now, I am looking at my personal workspace. It's called My Workspace, and you see it on the left-hand side here. This is My Workspace. This is like my personal repository for all my dashboards, data sets, and reports that I create. If I want to create a collaborative environment where I can work with others, 
I can create a group workspace and then give others access to that group workspace so that more than one person can start doing development at the same time. To do that, you can select that you want to create a group workspace. Let's see, where did it go? They, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's right here. You hit the down arrow next to my workspace. And I can add, tell it that I want to add a new group workspace and then add additional members to that workspace. And basically the idea of how this works is I would give it a name, so I can call this Power BI Takeover. Tell it who do I want to add as members to this. So I would add members right here, so I could add Liz right here. Okay. And anyone else I wanted to add. And then it would basically give us a workspace that we could work together on, on a set of reports. So not only could she view the reports, but she could edit and collaborate with me on them. You could have variable level levels of privacy to it if you wanted to. You can, you can tell it you know, how much uh, do I want her to be able to uh, work on the reports. Uh, that's all built in the group workspaces. This basically behind the scenes does a couple things. It will create a, uh, an AD group, an Active Directory group. It will also do, uh, create a OneDrive for Business account where you can publish your, your files that you work on and collaborate with together. And uh, there's a few other things it does as well, but those are some of the key things that you should know. When you create a group workspace, they show up on the left-hand side here where you can select work, which workspace you want to uh, work with. So for example, I have this one here called Open to Anyone. I can select that and I can see there's a few reports that have already been created here. And it's a whole other uh, environment or a whole other repository of dashboards, reports, and data sets here as opposed to the one we saw earlier. It's not my personal one. These are actually ones that I'm working on with other people. And then if I wanted to, I could even tell it that I want to have somebody set as favorites. I can have a favorite set of dashboard items that I, I, I want to apply there as well. All right, let me go back to my workspace. Because the la last few things, the last few minutes that I have here, I want to make sure I showed you. I talked about this earlier. I want to make sure I get a chance to show you this really cool feature called Q&A. Q&A is a really neat feature which allows you to actually type in English type questions to your data and it return back results. So for example, if I wanted to ask a question of my data, let's say that I wanted to return back something like the uh, profit margin. You'll see there's this little search bar up at the top of my dashboard and I can ask question. I can say something like just type in profit margin. And this is the thing I told you was like a search engine where I can ask questions of my data. And I can type profit margin. You can see it brings back profit margin here. And I can pin the results of this little card visual to my dashboard. And so I'm pinning that to my dashboard now. And it shows up just like all the other visuals we saw earlier. You can see it right here. So my, my visual that I just created using Q&A shows up on the bottom. I can also do some other searches. So let's say uh, rather than searching for profit margin, let's search for total sales by country. So I can search for total sales by country. You can see it immediately creates a visual for me just, on base, just based on how I asked the question. I can then say, you know, based on how I asked the question, I can say, well, really, I'd like to see this as a bar, or no, excuse me, as a column chart. Let me type right. So I can say as a column chart, and you'll notice that it changes the visual here immediately just based on how I asked the question. I can also say that I want to sort the data. So I can say sort by, uh, let's say sort by total sales descending. And you'll notice here that it also sorts the data for me descendingly when I ask the question that way. So it's really smart in how you ask questions, literally English questions, it interprets and changes the data here properly for me. One other example I'll show you here, let's say that I want to see the profit, uh, profit margin by, uh, actually tell you what, let's do this. I want to do a different one here. Let's say total sales by country, okay, as a map. And then look at that, it's able to map it out for me just based on the fact that I asked for it in a map. It saw the countries and mapped out the countries on a map properly for me. So really, really cool features. You can, of course, add more to this. I could say uh, by a class if I wanted to, and you'll notice it turns those into a little pie. I'm not a big fan of the pie chart, but you'll notice here that it actually adds a little bit to that if I wanted it to. Really, really neat way of being able to visualize the data just by how you, how you ask questions. Okay? So that's, that's called Q&A. It's a feature built into Power BI. Now the last piece here that I want to bring up here, I, talked, I told you I talked about mobile BI. And obviously you're not going to be able to view my, my phone or my mobile device from this webinar. But what I can share with you is, is at least a picture of what it looks like. And we have some visuals here in the slide deck that I'll share with you to get you a good idea of how Power BI and mobile applications work. 
And then um, as I'm pulling this up, the one other thing here I want to make sure I at least bring up here is refreshing the data. I know there's some questions about that. You can schedule data to be refreshed through a couple steps. One of those steps is you actually need to set up a data refresh on the data set. So you'll see, you'll look underneath the data set section here, and then the ellipses, you can tell that you want to schedule a data refresh. Now that's not the only step you have to do, that's only one of the steps. To schedule a data refresh, you also need to create a connection between your data sources and Power, the Power BI service. That can be done in one of two ways, either the enterprise data gateway or the personal gateway. And both of those gateways you can find more information about, because I know we're running out of time here, both of those gateways you can find more information about if you go to powerbi.com, you'll find Power BI gateways here and it'll tell you and describe to you why would you choose a personal gateway versus an enterprise gateway. Here's, here's the 30 second answer to that question. The personal gateway is going to be used for, uh, think of more your business analyst. Your business analyst that has a bunch of Excel files on their desktop and they want to be able to create uh, data connections to the Power BI service. They have files on their desktop and they want to be able to also use their credentials that they have to different data sources to, to refresh the data. That's a genuine case for a personal gateway. The enterprise gateway is for much larger sets of users, not just one individual user, but entire departments or entire organizations. And you would actually install the personal gateway somewhere on the network, on the, on the server, for example, to be able to create a connection between your on-premises data and the cloud service. So that's how you can get refreshes to work, is by creating either a personal gateway or an enterprise gateway and then you would go to the Power BI service that we were looking at a moment ago, and through the Power BI service, you can schedule a data refresh right here. Okay? All right, now the last piece that we have time to talk about is Mobile BI. So I'm going to bring over the slides for this last bit here. Mobile BI allows you to obviously connect to your data through every type of device, uh, Apple devices, Google devices, Windows, all of it you can do with a native Power BI application. Things that you can do with the mobile application, by the way, as soon as you create a dashboard on the Power BI service, they immediately show up on your phone. And that way I can start to actually interact with the data by adding things like annotations. That's what you're seeing on the screen here now, where you can actually write text or you can put full smiley faces or draw on it. You can do a lot of neat things with the annotations. But it allows you to share the results that you see from your mobile device and email it to others. You can also do things like create favorites or favorite visuals. And basically the idea of creating a favorite visual is, you know, you're looking at your, your dashboard on a mobile device. So if you're looking at it from a mobile device, it can be a little difficult to see all these things on, on your dashboard. So the idea of creating a favorite is to create and, and add favorites for ones that are just your most typical visuals that you want to look at. So here's the most typical visuals that I look at. I pin these and I make these favorites so that way when I open my phone, I don't have to scroll through 10 different visuals. I can just go straight to my favorites and see all of the ones that are most important to me. Okay, so that's what favorites are for. One of my favorite pieces about mobile devices is the alerts. And what the alerts allows you to do is through certain types of visuals, is, is specifically ones like the card visuals, they will allow you to create notifications or alerts that are like push notifications to your phone. Just like you get uh, email notifications, emails that pop up on your phone, you can also have uh, alerts for your data. And so you can actually alert on your data, so if a value goes above or below a certain value, which is what you're seeing on the screenshot here, you get notified of that change. And so that's really a cool benefit that you get from doing alerts. All right, that is actually, I, I went down to the wire there, I know you probably felt a little rushed there towards the end, I tried, tried to pace myself a little bit there. But that is, that is it for our time today. I do want to share this with you guys as we leave. I have another special offer for you. I know I feel like the cheap used car salesman here. But we also do teach this much lengthier version of this course, basically like th uh, four days of what you just experienced over the same content, but more in depth. We have a Power BI virtual training that we also do as well. So if you can't travel to Jacksonville and you want a live instructor, then you can be a part of our Power BI virtual training, which right now we have for 20% off. That training class, at least, I believe, is next week, right? Uh, yes, but we do have several more scheduled throughout the year. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in that, we have a 20% off code. Again, for you attending this course today, we have a 20% off code that you can go to our website, enter in Power BI, and that'll give you 20% off our virtual training. If you would like a live instructor but can't necessarily travel, that's a good method as well. That's basically the same experience that you got today where you have someone talking live to you, but they can pace themselves a little better across four days instead of just three hours. So uh, same idea though, you kind of get the idea. 
I wanted to make sure I point out those offers that we brought up, and Liz is going to send out a follow-up email that's going to have all those special offers, including the on-demand training, the live boot camp that's going to be in Jacksonville, and this offer as well. Yep. So that, that, that information will be restated in the email that you guys normally get that has the link to the recording. So you guys will receive that tomorrow. Um, if you need anything in between now and then, please feel free to email Devin or I, and we'll be happy to, I'll either pass on any questions or answer any questions you might have. Um, and as always, like I said, the recording, yep, there's Devin's email address. Um, as always, the recording will be available. Like I said, we usually try and get it up the next day, but since this is a little longer, it might take, you know, an extra day or so. Um, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. I know it was a long session, but you guys stuck with us, um, so we appreciate yeah. it. And let us know if you would like to see things like this again. Um, we're always, you know, looking to do new things, so if this was useful to you guys, let us know. We could do it on different topics, so just let us know. Um, and thanks again. Thanks, Devin. Thanks, and I'll, I'll try and uh, as soon as I can, there's a lot of great questions. I will try and answer those via my blog. I know we ran out of time towards the end. But again, if you, if you put those questions in the chat window, I will be able to uh, read those later and answer them via blog. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thanks.